welcome to this meeting of the Education Committee. Can I ask Assembly Broadcasting to add all members to the spotlight and to keep them there for the first four agenda items? Any apologies, Clark? Uh, Robin Newton. Okay. Any other apologies? I see everybody's here. Oh, okay. Okay, then move to draft minutes, agenda item three. Can I refer members to draft minutes of the committee meeting of the 21st of August 2020 at page six of your meeting packs and seek your agreement that the minutes are a complete and accurate record of proceedings? Is this agreed? Agreed. Thank you. Okay, there are no matters arising. And I'll move to agenda item five then. Can I ask Assembly Broadcasting to remove all members who are not in room 30 from the spotlight and to add the Nick two witnesses who have dialed in and bring us to agenda item five then, our briefing on restart from Nick two. And can I welcome, as they're coming into the room, Maxine Murphy Higgins, chairperson Nick two and uh, ETUG and Nazriant. In person, uh, can I also welcome Alan Law, Vice Chairperson of ETUG and NIPSA, remotely, Denise Walker, GMB, remotely, Anne Speed, Unison, remotely, and Thomas McMichael, Unite, in person. They're all very welcome. Can I refer members to their packs? Page 13 in particular includes a covering note from the clerk. Page 22 has a relevant paper and previous correspondence from Nick Iktu. And finally, at page 26 of meeting packs is a copy of previous restart papers from ASCL and NITC. Can I advise witnesses that the committee will give you 15 minutes to make an opening statement and then take questions from the members? Thank you. You're very okay. welcome. Thank you very much, and we welcome this opportunity to be able to meet with you today. Um, the Education Trade Union Group is made up of affiliated trade unions of the Northern Ireland Irish Congress of Trade Unions, and it represents all education employees, including principals, teachers and support staff. The trade union, Education Trade Union Group are a policy-making committee, and we don't engage in collective bargaining on behalf of our members. Today we are here to make representations, uh, mainly on behalf of the support staff who work in our schools and, and in the other areas of the support sector. Um, each of our members who are here today will address you, as you say, in, in, um, uh, in order of Alan Long, Anne Speed, Denise Walker and then Thomas Michael, McMichael. So I'll pass over to Alan Law. I don't think they're actually on the line right now, so I think we had a little technical problem. So... Okay. Uh, is, it, that, is he there? That says Alan is there, yeah. Oh, he's just appeared. There we go. Alan, are you, can you hear us? <coughs> yes, yes, sorry, I'm 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 sorry, Chairperson, as Vice Chair of the Education Trade Union Group, I'd like to thank you and the committee for the opportunity to meet with you today. We hope that this will be the start of continuing engagement. Our attendance today is to contribute to your oversight of the Education Restart Plan's new school day, and we hope that by sharing our experience of the implementation of these plans, we can ensure more effective consultation processes in the future. In the lead up to the reopening of schools, there have been a number of attacks on the integrity of the ed education workforce by politicians. Trade union side wants to see the safe reopening of schools. Our members have always wanted schools to reopen with the best international practice and understanding of COVID-19 prevention measures in place. We all recognise that education is hugely important in the development of children and young people. We'd also remind you that those ending child poverty, ensuring families live in homes that are fit for purpose, politicians should be directing their attention to these feelings before they attack trade unions for wanting to ensure a safe environment for the return of schools. Trade unions side met with the Minister prior to the commencement of lockdown, where we were advised by the Department of Education plans to provide childcare and schools to support key workers. This group met regularly during the intervening months, initially daily, and as these plans settled into more routine delivery twice weekly. This demonstrated to us that the concept of effective engagement was clearly understood and worked well. The new school day subgroup was formed from these arrangements. Trade Union Trade does not accept that the consultation process for the new school day was effective. The, the documents issued in June were, were responded to, but the process was hierarchical, 
with no feedback or engagement on contributions and responses made. In August, when the Minister binned these plans and issued new guidance for the reopening of schools, which has brought about the full return of all pupils, the consultation process deteriorated into farce. The draft document dropped into inboxes at 17.31 without any prior warning that it was imminent and advised that full responses be received by 21.30. The next morning, requests for extensions were made and we were given until 3 p.m. This is not consultation and we request that all references to consultation and agreement with trade union side be removed. It is, essential that, it is essential during this pandemic that pupils, parents and staff understand the messages arising from the department and the chief medical officer. This communication must be consistent and the practices arising from it must be adhered to. It was therefore particularly galling that the Department of Education would issue a press statement on behalf of the Minister advising that teachers and pupils would be required to wear face masks in corridors and communal areas, whilst ignoring the almost 15,000 support staff. I've since clarified that they were intended to be included in this message, but in the haste to issue the, it, the Department used teachers instead of staff. There was no consultation around this issue. It remains hugely insulting to our members that they were simply ignored. It was then only a few days later that the Minister would attend a meeting in a school where he failed to follow the guidance issued, issued by the Department concerning adults attending meetings lasting more than 15 minutes that they should wear a mask. This was an opportunity to show clear leadership and to demonstrate to pupils and staff that the Minister takes their health seriously and would have been a very clear and strong message to everyone. He failed. His statements since how about this have um, his statements since about how he was offered a coffee and that you can't drink it through a mask or glib and are not becoming of someone with such an important role in helping to prevent the spread of infection. I want to go on to risk assessments. Uh, trade union side have been compl completely frustrated by the laissez-faire attitude to risk assessment process, and we've received huge numbers of reports from members indicating that they have not received a risk assessment, participated in the assessment process, or aware of how it was conducted. We have also been advised that some principals are appending disclaimers to, the, to these, advising that they aren't qualified to complete them and therefore feel unsure if the assessment is accurate. We note that this concern is shared by the teaching unions as well, and we believe that it requires significant attention. It has been impossible for us to reconcile the differing advice given to various sectors within the community in relation to the restart of activities. So, and some examples include, for example, a 13 year old traveling on public transport must wear a face covering. On school services, this is only strongly recommended. A school leaver at year 12 who then goes on to an FE college will be advised that social distancing must be maintained at all times and where it can't be, a face mask must be worn, whereas the same age group returning to a school will be told that social distancing rules have been relaxed and that there is no need to wear a face mask. Aerosol generating procedures occur in some special needs schools with children attending who have a range of complex needs. These will happen in classrooms where other adults are, and pupils are present. Uh, whereas in a dental practice, an aerosol generating procedure will require a fallow period of an hour before the next patient can be seen in the surgery. Our classroom assistants are extremely worried about this um, and worried about the plans for the return of special schools, the availability of PPE, the accuracy and validity of risk assessments, and ultimately the safety of the children in their care. We share these concerns and believe it requires special attention. We do not want to see a repeat of the care home crisis that occurred during the lockdown period. And finally, um, the restart guidance issued by the Minister on the 13th of August refers to low rates of community transmission and relies on advice by the Chief Medical Officer to that effect. Whereas two days previously, on the 11th of August, the CMO wrote to the CEOs of the health trusts advising that infection rates were rising and that all staff now must wear face masks. The letter issued by the CMO and CSO of England, Wales, Scotland and Northern Ireland advises control measures such as hand and surface hygiene, cohorting to reduce the number of daily contacts and directional controls to reduce face-to-face -face contact remain key elements of maintaining COVID-19 secure school environments and minimising risk. We do not believe these arrangements exist 
and we will explore this further from contribution from colleagues. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Alan. Clark, did you say you had an issue in the connection? I think I see you on there. there. Yeah. So. Okay. Maxine, Chance. is that your... Is that your and speed then would be next. Okay. Yes. Good morning, members. Can you hear me okay? We can, Ann, yes. <clears throat> Apologies there, I was having uh, technical difficulties. Uh, well, thank you for the opportunity to uh, present to the committee. We were concerned that a lot of the dialogue and discourse around the, all of the issues. Uh, to do with the uh, reopening of schools was focusing largely on the pressures and responsibilities of our teaching colleagues and ignoring the fact that the majority of the actual school workforce uh, reside in the support service uh, constituency. Uh, our cleaners, our caterers, our grounds maintenance people, our classroom assistants who are actually in the classroom with teachers. So it's important that we bring that reality to your attention. And that was reflected in a number of statements made by the department, uh, commenting on plans and exhorting staff to respond to the need to get our children back to school. And on a number of occasions, support staff weren't mentioned and this caused a lot of upset and concern. So we know that the committee will give uh, this group of workers their, their full attention and support. I think uh, we are in unknown territory and uh, we know it's difficult. Uh, nobody has the all of the answers. We're learning as we go, both from the point of view of the employers, the department, school staff. Uh, but there were a number of, I think, mistakes made at the beginning, which was that the consultation process itself uh, and apologies if I'm repeating some of what Alan has said, I, I missed the beginning of his uh, evidence, was, but that this consultation process was built in a, a kind of hierarchical structure. And a lot of the responsibility for uh, moving the process ahead was placed on the, on the shoulders of the school principals, uh, who are educators in the first instance and not public health. Uh, experts. And that, if you like, approach uh, informed what then happened, which was we have co had consultation sessions with the department, but that they were stratified. And we all missed the point that really what we need at the school level is a team approach, a COVID defence team approach. And I'm afraid that I that hasn't really been uh, called for, we haven't built it at school level, and indeed we don't appear to have uh, built it at educational, departmental level either. We're not aware to any great extent of the any interaction with the Department of Health and what any cross um, communication or cross, cross strategizing has uh, occurred. But we do know in the last couple of weeks that the public health agency has uh, taken on board the, uh, the, the, the responsibility to both um, consider and develop uh, the, all of the issues that are now going to emerge in the coming weeks around uh, the reopening of schools. Uh, we understand, though we haven't ever been formally advised, uh, and we think we should be, uh, as, as a lead trade union, uh, trade unions in education uh, of any structures that are going to be built now. We understand this, some uh, a, a committee being developed by the BHA uh, and we think that trade unions should have seats at that table because we need that kind of all encompassing team building approach if we are going to work our way through uh, all the difficulties. Um, the uh, the issue of funding as well is extremely important. Uh, we know that there's been funding in the first instance set aside to assist uh, students with technical uh, uh, needs and access to IT uh, supports for uh, online er learning, and that this will be. Uh, uh, 
continued, though we've never been told to what degree into the new school year. But there's also a huge need for financial support for support services for all of the infrastructural change that is now being required. We've seen it in the first instance uh, on the transport service where all the school buses have now got to be fitted with screens. There is an impact on the amount of children who can be taken in a school bus, uh, the uh, availability of PPE, uh, installing hand sanitizers on buses. All of that requires funding. We do know that the EEA has submitted a business case, uh, and we've only just recently had that shared with us uh, as of yesterday, business case for uh, increased funding. So we are looking to the committee to support that call for increased funding. I know there are pressures right across the system. I read the figures today about uh, the estimate that two billion has been spent on COVID defence and uh, trade unions do appreciate that the executive is, is, is doing its best, but more needs to be done. And we do need the support of the committee to support um, funding for, for, for uh, school services. Because we, you know, the, the school experience is a whole, a whole school experience, a whole staff and school experience. Uh, obviously, the principal is important, he or she leads, the teachers deliver education syllabus, uh, the canteen and catering staff deliver school meals, and I think there is a need to ensure that school meals, free school meals, are not only continued but expanded. It's going to be absolutely crucial in the coming period. Uh, the grounds maintenance people, the staff who clean the schools and hygiene and cleaning will be important. There will be a need for extra funding there and there may be a need for extra staff and cleaning schedules. So all of these things uh, require support to make the school day a safe experience for the staff uh, who are can have deep concerns and for the pupils who need to get back to school. So we need the support of the committee to uh, refocus the attention of the department in particular uh, on the whole school experience and to ensure that the public health leadership agency and 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 uh, and experts um, develop and continue a strategy that is a whole team strategy, a one team strategy. That's what should be happening now within education. It should be happening at a school level and also closer and tighter cross departmental engagement uh, around uh, the health issues. This is learning for everybody. Uh, we've never been here before. There needs to be a lot more interaction and a lot more flexibility. So um, one final uh, comment, testing regimes. Uh, we know that there's a huge demand now and uh, from the health side, we're very aware of what happened with the care homes and the delay in uh, strengthening testing regimes. There should be no delay inside education and all the resources that are required to make sure any infection challenges are met very quickly and staff and students are alike are protected as much as possible. So thank you for the opportunity to address the committee. Thank you, Anne. I think we're moving to Denise Walker now. Good morning. Good morning. Can you Denise. hear me okay? Yes. Um, well, thank you again for the opportunity to present um, to yourselves today. Um, support staff in our schools feel that they have been largely overlooked, yet their, the roles that they carry out are essential to the smooth running of our schools and our education system. Yesterday, they heard from the CMO that hundreds of school children will likely contract COVID this winter. Thankfully, for the vast majority of those young people, it will be a minor hiccup. But for the adults in our schools, it could be a different outcome. The guidance produced by the department is vague and ambiguous in far too many areas and open to interpretation by everyone from the EA to the 1100 school principals. And never mind driving a, heart, a horse and cart through it, you could probably handbrake the Titanic and still miss the iceberg. Um, adults should maintain two metres distance from each other and from pupils where possible and where it is not possible then mitigation should be in place. 
Face masks and coverings, they're strongly recommended, but they're not mandatory. And the department referenced only pupils and teachers, leaving other staff guessing and once again feeling that they don't matter. Bubbles have extended in some cases to entire year groups and no recognition has been made of staff who work across those bubbles. The vast majority of support staff in schools carry out multiple roles. Marie might work in the morning as a prime, in a, at a primary school as catering assistant, but clean the local secondary school in the afternoon. Debbie might be a bus escort before school, then work as a general or classroom assistant in the morning before taking up her role as a lunchtime supervisor, finishing up as the bus escort on the way home. How many bubbles can you work across and stay safe? Enhanced cleaning. Where's the provision for the cleaning taking place? Um, schools have yet to ask for additional cleaning hours, and that's most likely because their budgets are already stretched. Remember only last year, principals asking parents to buy toilet roll. Well, what has changed? Um, cleaning services were already operating at the bare minimum and many settings had reduced hours. It's critical that proper funding is made available to schools and to the EA. An investment is made into the services that will be needed to maintain safer schools. The status quo is not an option in the new COVID world that we navigate. And as a minimum, all schools should have a have received an uplift in their budget to secure additional cleaning services. And we cannot make the same mistakes that have been made before by outsourcing essential cleaning and the likes of hospitals. We must ensure that staff and pupils are safe and feel safe. School days and school life are a complex mix of people and roles, and each of those roles are important. It's critical that each of those invested in the school are properly considered and their views and requirements are not just sought, but that they feel actively involved in the overall plan. The only way we can navigate this next phase in COVID life is by working together and being fully inclusive of the views of the entire workforce. My colleagues have referenced the lack of proper consultation and the need to work with the PHA. But we also need to look at task forces within the school settings that will draw on the experience and the requirements of each group within that workforce, not just teachers and pupils. Best practice can be shared between schools and mistakes can provide the lessons learned. We understand the needs to get our children back to school and we welcome children returning back to school, but that needs to happen in a safe environment. And the mental health of our pupils and of our staff must also be paramount and that is best served where both feel safe and all anxieties are removed or minimised. Remember, these are education establishments. Schools are not the nation's child mountain service. So again, thank you for your time today. Thank you, Denise. And now moving to Thomas. Uh, Chairperson and members, thanks again. I'll, I'll reiterate that thank you for the invitation and the opportunity to voice concerns regarding school restart and for myself in particular uh, transport. I'm going to refer to transport and specifically referring in on what I've got to say uh, to what most of us would commonly call the yellow buses. Uh, the COVID pandemic inadvertently shone a spotlight on many issues in dedicated transport. Issues ranging from an ageing fleet due to a lack of investment, right through to a lack of amenities for drivers and escorts to avail of basic welfare facilities. That's due to no investment, or none that I can see, and a lack, lack of empathy or a will to find a solution. Prior to school closures, uh, bus drivers and bus escorts basically used school facilities for uh, washroom facilities, school staff rooms. Uh, quite a lot of schools would let us use their staff rooms for a cup of tea, eat our sandwiches, whatever, a hot drink. Now there's nowhere. The schools, essentially, most principals don't allow us across the door. Um, some concessions are made where the ladies are allowed in and the men have to use an outside uh, toilet. 
We've also got a lack of facilities to complete a full daily cleaning regime. We're told cleanliness to keep the virus at bay. Cleanliness is the first line of defence. For example, spray down and wipe down hot touch points several times throughout the day with an enhanced clean at the, de- at the end of the day. That's really our cleaning regime. We've around 700 buses finishing at the same rough window at the end of the day, between 4 or 5 o'clock. It's 700 across the province, all going into schools where they park up. We don't have any depots. We don't have any facilities. Um, I'll give you an example. The school that I park at has one hose and a mountain bucket, which we would use over the course of the week whenever you get a chance, so everyone's not going at one time. Now we're being asked to go in at the end of the day, within an hour, in the school again, I'll refer to the same one, about 30 buses get it mopped out and cleaned out with no facilities, no hot water. The result, as far as I can see, is that, is that buses will not receive the full enhanced clean required daily. Just impossible to happen. I know of some drivers who are resorting to take their bus home on and, uh, and their driveway. Basically, transport staff need welfare amenities and cleaning facilities urgently. That must be provided by the Education Authority. And they in turn need financial investment. And I would ask for financial investment, specifically ring fenced, that provision for the, for the uh, EA. Then there's also what I would call the absolute disregard for bus staff on a return to what is still a dangerous work environment. Disregard towards their physical and mental well-being. This is highlighted by a lack of meaningful consultation with trade unions and drivers and escorts. Trade unions-wise meetings were held, but not through consultations. They're essentially this is what we think is going to happen. Give us a response and we'll have a look at it. Response is ignored for a lot of days and then at the next meeting, we've had a look at that, but okay, we can twitch that wee bit, but we're going ahead with what we're doing, which in, in turn with transport was very little. We feel that EA management imposed their ill thought out plans on us. For example, driver screens, cab screens were deemed, and still are, deemed unnecessary. And to quote um, a concession to the unions, that mass would be sufficient for drivers who didn't need screens. I would say anyone with any common sense would know that wearing a mask for myself, for example, wearing cla- glasses, it just doesn't work. Glasses steam up. And I'd hate to be turning the corner and the glasses steam up with 30 kids behind me. That's an example of basic stuff that I feel they got wrong. And even to this day, <coughs> they've started put, they've put screens in. They're not all in yet, yet the schools are back a week and a half now. Um, but they've put them in, really, through gritted teeth. There was no input sought from those who actually do the job. Minimum PPE, and from experience so far, I would say the cheapest to get fined. The Minister removing social distancing for pupils in schools and in transport. Yet in schools, the kids are kept in bubbles. Uh, Teachers still with PPE, keep a one metre distance where mostly possible. Yet in transport, we were actually told, scrapped. Bus escorts were put into the back of buses with 30, if there's 33 seats, 32 children, and an escort with a mask on. Sometimes up, up to an hour of a journey. I would remind you that drivers and escorts 
are of a certain age, myself included. Um, I, I, figures was given last year. Um, the average age group of drivers is late 50s. I think 57 at the time was specifically used. Um, now, if that's the average, that would tell you there's quite a few, quite a high number, probably in their 60s, self-included. Um, many with underlying health issues, and we've had exactly the same problems as mentioned earlier uh, by Alan uh, regarding risk assessments. We literally had to beg for individual risk assessments. Uh, drivers and escorts are expected to be treated with respect, dignity and genuine regard for their welfare, but receive the opposite. It's essentially just get the wheels turning, get onto the bus, put a mask on and off you go. The phrase used regularly nowadays is we're all in this together, but support staff have not been treated as such due to decisions made by the Minister and treatment by EA management. I'll finish off by saying to you, support staff, just like staff in all workplaces and beyond, are your constituents. And we would call on this committee to ask serious questions of the Minister, uh, those, those decision makers, with a view to making the working day of transport workers and other support staff safer. That's it. Thank you. Okay. That's all right, Mrs. Clark. Yeah. Okay. Do you want to make any further comments? Oh, just some final comments, yeah. just in, in relation to uh, to our members around. Essentially, if you were to ask, what what are we looking from you today? And it's around, which is, and just in in summary, you know, we want a review mechanism of the reopening of schools guidance, as we've already pointed out to you today. There's inconsistencies between the reopening of schools. The PHA guidance between the Department of Health and also um, the Department of Economy. So there's differences there between the reopening of schools. There's, you know, we've already mentioned again about the guidelines that they do need to be stronger. There's too many. I think that Denise put it really well when she brought in the, the Titanic that you literally could turn it. Um, and that's really difficult and really difficult for our 1100 school principals to try and manage because when it's so, you know, where, it, where possible is used so often and where practicable, which means you let, what, what is the guidance? Um, and that is causing <laughs> a lot of concern. That combined with the level of risk assessments, because again, I might have been extremely vulnerable, clinically vulnerable, so I was shielding <coughs> up until the 31st of July, and you, now you're going to ask me to go into a school with potentially 1,200 people or on a bus in very close proximity to 30 children. So there's real inconsistencies there and how do you do a risk assessment where someone wasn't allowed out of the house up to the 31st of July and now all of a sudden if there's strict social distancing taking place of two metres that they can then return to school. And our concern here is it's only two metres where, they, where it's practicable. We're in schools here and very often we're dealing with young people. One of the other um, commentators there discussed where classroom assistants are using equipment that in dentists they will then require them to carry out a full clean for an hour before they reuse that room again. You know, where this is happening in our special schools on a regular basis. Um, we do believe that in bringing in the consistency, there needs to be consistency between the departments. As we have said, they're led, we understand, by the uh, PHA, and we believe the trade unions should have a say at that table and should be at that table because look at the number of people that we are representing in Northern Ireland and you know they are your constituents, our members, and they need to have their say in relation to how we have our, our schools a safe place to be. The big part of this is the funding and finance. Um, the restart agreement talked about the building supervisors may wish to relook at their cleaning regime on a daily basis. The difficulty was there was no added finance put to that. We already know that it is a, a we're, we're being told that the cleaning of touch points are vital in, the, in our defence against this COVID-19 pandemic. Yet, as far as we can see, there has not been one penny put to the extra cleaning of our schools. And I think that has to be dealt with in a very, uh, very, very quickly, because otherwise, what defences are we putting in to defeat the COVID-19, or certainly to protect 
the spread of it in our communities, because ultimately how many thousands of children and teachers and support staff do we have going into those schools every day? Um, so it's vital that we um, provide that. So I think those would be our, our key asks of you today to, you know, to put that to the minister as to how that's going to be dealt with. Um, and we would hope that our schools, I think as all of us have reiterated here today, that we want our schools to be safe places and we want our children to be able to learn, but we want it done in a safe environment. Thank you, yes. Maxine, and, and thank you to all our, our witnesses today. Um, it is absolutely vital that we hear your voices um, as we work together to ensure that school restart is as safe as possible. Um, I assure you that no member of this committee, to the best of my knowledge, um, has remotely attacked the, the trade unions over their concerns for safe return to school. And we take this opportunity to again thank teaching, non-teaching staff for the outstanding resilience um, and professionalism with which they've uh, approached the, the school restart to make it possible for so many pupils across Northern Ireland. We hear the concerns that you're raising. They are consistent um, with a number of concerns that we have already received, although there are additional concerns and very helpful detail um, that you've gone into in relation to those concerns. So we will ensure that we raise them with the Department of Education and with the Education Authority on your behalf. Um, I was going to ask you if there were specific um, confidence building measures that we could take immediately, but I think you've covered um, a number of those. I also wanted to ask one other question. Um, with regards to testing, um, you, you and your members will be familiar with testing programmes provided to other key workers. Um, do, do you think that uh, a testing programme bespoke for the school community would be helpful in ensuring a safe um, school restart? I mean, I, if none of the others want to come in, I'll answer that. Just Yes, if I, if I could answer that, um, Chair. Um, yes, being involved with uh, on the health side as well from a health workers trade union point of view, there's some learning from what happened in the care homes. First of all, there was the delay, and we did emphasise uh, this morning that uh, a prompt and uh, fast um, uh, testing service is essential. Uh, there were designated sites for the care home sector. What we found there was that they were provided independently and the results took longer. So the, while uh, a direct NHS worker would get a result in 24 hours, independent provision meant they had to wait 72 hours. So that gap was eventually closed, so we want to avoid that. Number two, there was then the um, establishment of mobile units and uh, there was an extension of um, the number of health staff who were available to conduct this testing. We, on the health side, trade union side, we have um, engagement with the PHA uh, uh, testing and, contact and uh, tracing unit and there's some learning there as well so I think we need a very tight focus on this from PHA and as my colleagues have said we need to be in that conversation as quickly and as soon as possible so the learning from the uh, surge period on the health side should be absolutely uh, inform what we do mobile units would probably be essential in terms of uh, school, uh, you know, uh, geographical uh, uh, locations, and uh, in order to get prompt response, so all of that detail uh, needs to be worked through. But I think a focus on that is essential, and we would welcome the committee's attention. Okay, thanks for that. And um, can I bring in Deputy Chairperson Karen Mullen, MLA? <clears throat> thank you, and thank you everybody for coming along uh, today. And um, just following on what the Chair has said, I also um, want to say that myself or my party has not been involved in any t attacks against the unions. 
and in fact on numerous occasions we have called on the Minister and his department um, to ensure that the unions were central uh, to all of the consultations and restart and it's very very disappointing for us to sit here again this week after two weeks ago when some of your colleagues were on here expressing um, the same experience that yourselves have expressed today uh, and also that this assembly passed a motion um, not too long ago calling for the widest po possible engagement and consultation um, with stakeholders and again including unions and for all of that we were we had pointed out to the minister this committee again two weeks ago in relation to the approach that was agreed and signed up to us by all in the new decade new approach which was co-design and it's not about um, sending documents out to yourselves at the last minute asking for a bit of feedback and then not taking them on so again it's very disappointing to hear from each of you today that that process has continued and I can assure you the work in the committee here we will continue to the, the department or an EA will be on after this meeting so we'll be following up on a number of these couldn't agree more um, with Anne around the team approach and, and it is, it's the whole, I always describe it as the whole school approach, um, and, it, and it is a team. So um, it's disappointing to hear that a, a large majority of the workforce has not been involved, included, or also their concerns taken on board. Um, there's a number of things that has been raised here today. The finances, again, there was money allocated there um, by the finance minister a couple of weeks ago. We've been pressing the department to get that funding, the details even out under the skulls, to let them know how much they're getting, what it is for. And I know um, uh, Denise had raised about cleaning. I know my own local schools, some of the schools in my area, they have employed extra cleaners to come in with the hope that the money is going to come to cover it. Um, but if that doesn't come, that will be very short term and it, and it will probably have to stop. Very, very concerning to hear from yourself as well, Thomas around the cleaning of um, the buses, how you have been treated. So again, we will pick up on that um, and we will possibly, definitely probably have to come, come back to these. But to hear that most of the flight is probably, ev nearly every child is back now today and, and that is the approach, cleaning buses without hot water. Um, what if you go to the school and it's closed up and you can't even get access, all of that. So we need to follow up on that. Um, just trying to pick up what everybody had said. Just on, on your, um, there was a paper that came through to us in the, uh, for the committee, and it mentions, but it didn't go into any detail about the school meals, school meal provision, just a concern around hot meal. I wanted to ask, is, um, is there any of the schools or anywhere that is not going to be providing a hot meal? We, we met with the Education Authority to discuss the meal service and they were not able to provide any assurances that they would be that school hot, that hot meals would be provided in, in any school. Uh, the view essentially was that um, this was an ask that they weren't uh, in a position to deliver and it was particularly around how they would maintain social distance and ensuring that there would be safety for everyone receiving the, the meals. So, um, and also the um, the geographic layout of many of the schools would make it almost impossible to maintain food temperatures and get the meals to classrooms if, if, they, if the option was to have children eat in their classroom. So it, it seems that in, prob that in many cases, um, children will only be getting a packed lunch and we feel that that does not deliver what should be what should be happening for children who have access to free school meals we believe they should be receiving a hot meal and a hot meal every day and that's something that the department needs to give urgent attention to agree we alan so that's a humble question after this i know it had been put forward that um there could have been obviously difficulties but i haven't heard any follow-up on it so we will we will definitely query that. And then just lastly, Chair, I know we have went over, you have nearly answered this around the guidance. We, we all know about the lack of guidance that's, or the lack of detail that's in it. Um, uh, uh, but 
and you have highlighted some of it. My concern was, I suppose, and wanted to hear from you is about how your members, did they feel safe going back to school? But you have nearly answered that. But, um, and we have also raised the concerns around the risk assessments as well. So you have raised it <coughs> here today. But, you know, what support is there for staff with health concerns and has um, adaptions been put in place? So say, Thomas, like yourself had said, about being a bus driver and possibly with a health condition, maybe not able to do it. Are you, you know, is there an ad adaption that rather than you go home and go on the sick, or you know, is there any of that being worked out? I mean, the, the, the difficulty we have here is that it was the guidance that we've already said was put out to the schools to decide on the 1,100 you know, different establishments that we have. So it's wide and varied. So some people have been allowed in the initial time to work from home. Is our understanding certainly some of the the teaching staff it may not be the same for some of the sports staff but even the majority of the teaching staff who i've been um, dealing with and the support staff are are the same where basically they're saying we are following the two meters you can stay two meters but at the end of it says we're practical so the problem we have is our our teachers are in yes they can wear masks or visors or but equally, do they feel safe? Quite a number of them that do not. Because I go back to the point I made, the 31st of July, these extremely clinically vulnerable people were, work at, were at home and were not allowed to go out. As we know, their, 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 uh, work, their going about was being very much restricted. And then come basically the 17th of August, they were told, you know, we're carrying out a risk assessment. And as long as you strictly adhere to the two metre distance, you can return. Now, I don't know about you, but that to me very much feels like they were at, they went from nothing to running a marathon in the space of of two weeks. And I think a lot of them were very concerned. And a lot of our members are reporting that the measures that are put in place, even within the school reopening, is not say a one way system. The one way system's not been adhered to. There's the sanitising stations. There's not the same the number that is needed. You know, there's talk, you know, in some areas where there's very little even of the sanitizer available. And we all know sanitizer is only a small part of this whole picture. But even if we can't get the amount of sanitizer available or hand washing facilities into our schools, then, you know, we are very concerned and our members are very concerned. And I think when you're living with that level of anxiety that we've all been living with from March, and now we've been told you're now able to go back to school. And they don't, unfortunately, feel very often with all. You know, we know that the people who are doing the risk assessments are trying their best. But the difficulty is, we're, when we look at the guidance, it really is, it's so, uh, it's not specific. And I don't think there's been enough guidance given to those who are carrying out the risk assessments or support, both in, in either advice and also in relation to the funds. And Maxine, see, see in the risk assessment, has uh, consideration been made or sought for medical evidence from um, a person? We are advising, certainly, and you know, we all are in the same, we would be advising our members to seek that medical evidence. So, yes, we certainly have been advising that. The difficulty we have here is that there is limited scope, as we know, for people to work from home when the school population is back. So, you know, for a lot of people, it is about trying to mitigate, yes, those risks. So, yes, there certainly has been medical. We would be advising all of our members, and I would say all of us here today would be doing the same, is to get medical evidence to support. And I think the difficulty we have is that we're asking them, putting pressure on our, yes. on our um, health service to provide um, medical evidence. Although they may have had shielding letters, they're now being asked for further evidence on that. And you're, I'm very conscious that we're then putting more pressure on our health service. Yeah, 100%. Can I just say that um, we are finding, in relation to me, uh, where medical evidence is sort of, or should be provided, um, our members, are, we need to be proactive in that. Uh, we're, we're being risk assessed by transport officers who have no uh, real qualification to do it um, and they aren't actually asking uh, it's just a case of what are your conditions or ailments whatever and then I'll get back to you and you get a phone call later on no shielding's finished you can go back to work and that's very concerning Thomas because very you know concerned. we've been saying weeks and months ago about the two departments working closely together yeah. Department of Health and Department of Education and looking at those health professionals, either from you know, <coughs> or wherever, being available, 
for not just for staff but also for children and young people. Um, uh, and there's risk assessments have to be carried out for them. But to, you know, in a lot of incidents, you need to be medically trained. Um, so, you know, it's disappointing to hear in the first week of September that it really has left up to members. And as you say, we all know pressure is on the health service, and it's nearly impossible to get an appointment. And it, we're going to clog the system up with that if we had to put a better plan in before, yeah. you know, a number of weeks ago. So, thank you. Yes. Mitigation measures to help prevent uh, the spread of infection is the wearing of face masks, and the department are now advising that uh, this should be. They're strongly advising that face masks should be worn on school transport services, communal areas, corridors. However, the uh, bid that the education authority has put in to fund this is to buy ten reusable face masks for every child. Ten. Now, ten for the transport services will be enough for one week. There is no intention to provide any face masks beyond that. And in order to get uh, people to wear face masks and for, and for that to be um, a norm within the service, uh, I don't think it's remotely acceptable that the Education Authority intends to provide one week supply. And that's, that's going to create um, well, it's going to create significant uh, pressures on family budgets because these are not uh, cheap, cheap items if you're buying them on a regular basis. And we don't think it's remotely acceptable that um, one week supply will be provided. And then after that, it's really up to families if they if they have the funding to purchase them. Okay, thanks. Okay, members, I have one, two, three, four, five, six more members to get through here. So if we can keep our questions as concise as possible and our, our responses as well, should be ample time to, to cover a number of issues. Uh, can I bring in William Humphrey, MLA? Uh, thank you very much, John. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, for your uh, presentation this morning. Uh, can I, as a governor uh, uh, of two schools, pay tribute to all teaching and non-teaching staff for the huge contribution they make to society and our young people in particular, particularly during these difficult uh, times? Um, and I first want to make, make a comment to say in relation to the I think it was Mr. Long, you referred to a press release that went out uh, that excluded or didn't include um, support staff uh, and the valuable work that they they do uh, from the department. That obviously should not have been the case. Those people should have been included. And I think that's something which the department will need to address when they come before this committee later this morning. Um, yesterday, as chair of the Public Accounts Committee, I met with the Karen Donnelly, the Auditor General for Northern Ireland, and I, I welcome the £2 billion investment and additional money from the UK Exchequer to Northern Ireland. Uh, that is a significant amount of money, and it doesn't obviously include the furlough scheme. But I understand and appreciate the pressures, not least as a governor and a constituency representative that our schools are under. Um, can I just say, in this scenario, communication and the dissemination of information is absolutely crucial and obviously can be life-saving at this moment in time. So one of the things I think is hugely important, and I'm, I am concerned to hear a number of people this morning talking about they've attended meetings. Uh, I think, Mr. Long, you referred to meetings were weekly and then they became bi-weekly or, or twice-weekly, sorry. Um, I'm concerned that people, Mr. McMichael referred to members attending meetings but not consultations, not true consultations, I think the term you used. I mean, I'm concerned about that. I mean, it sounds to me that um, people are attending meetings and feel that, are, that their opinions are not being valued or listened to. So that's something that does really um, concern me around all of this issue, Chairman. I think the other thing that came out very clearly as well is um, the issue that the Public Health Authority has set up a, a, a group to look at some of these issues, and there's no trade union representative. I think this committee should perhaps write to the Public Health Authority and suggest that there should be a trade union representative uh, around the issues of schools and education. I think that's absolutely vital because th those those views need to be, to be listened to. Yeah. But if I could perhaps draw down, Mr. Long, you, you mentioned the letter from the four chief medical officers for the four UK uh, nations. Um, and I think you, you said that um, you, did, you did not believe the, the arrangements currently exist, the arrangements they referred to in their letter. Um, <clears throat> What would be the view, your view or, or NIPS's view around that then? 
Well, in particular, um, the point I was making in relation to that was about the um, the regular cleaning within schools. We've met with the Education Authority to discuss the enhanced cleaning process, and they've made it quite clear that they haven't been asked to provide any additional cleans. Uh, that their cleaners will go into schools after those children leave, and that will be the clean for the day. And that there has been no ask of them to provide any enhanced cleans beyond that. And that, that clearly would be a failing in relation to the advice given by the chief medical officers. And also it talks about um, maintaining um, or reducing the number of daily contacts, um, uh, creating cohorts. And we feel the transport arrangements do not achieve that. We'll have children on school buses who are not maintaining any sort of social distancing. Um, they will then be going into schools and told to maintain a bubble whereas the bubble has been completely compromised on the journey to school. Um, most of the transport services are collecting children going to several schools. So you're not only having the bubble compromised in school A, you could have the bubble compromised in several schools. And that completely undermines the advice that has been given and the mitigation measures that the department argue the whole principle around the reopening is built. And so are, you saying, are, you, are you saying that the EEA has not given the guidance to um, the, the school principals around the arrangements set out by the, the, the four uh, chief medical officers of the United Kingdom in terms of Northern Ireland schools? Is that what you're saying? Well, what I'm saying is that uh, you know, control measures such as hand hygiene and surface hygiene are critical to that. And if there are no additional claims throughout the day, then that's not going to be achieved. So the, but the, what I'm asking you is, in your experience and your, to your knowledge, the EAA hasn't provided that? The EAA hasn't been asked by schools to provide that. That's very different. The EAA is ready and willing to deliver it. They haven't been asked. And, I, and we all believe that uh, the reason they haven't been asked is because school budgets have significant pressures that uh, principals probably can't afford to ask. And, and I just don't think that's acceptable. Can, can I move on? Can I move? Thanks for that. Can I move on then, Mr. McMichael? You, the, when you talk about transportation in the buses, um, you made made the comment meetings were not true consultations, um, and that you said that the EA plans were ill thought out. Can I ask you to expand on that, please? Um, ill thought out in, well, for example, in, in I think I'd, uh, use an example. I think I did use an example. Um, but ill thought out in that we're, what they're asking us to do, again, back to the cleaning, um, touch points throughout the day when you, when you have time. If you, if, you ha if you do a run from one school and you have to be somewhere else, you push on and do that and then do the touch points afterwards. So there's a bubble gone. Okay. Um, so one other thing that you also said that there was no input sought for, um, from those who do the job. Um, I mean, I, I, I am concerned about that uh, because obviously those who take the, the young people, you're, to, you're making specific reference, I think, as well, to the, to the EA, the Yellow Bus Fleet, are you? You're not talking about the TransLink Fleet and other private operators who will uh, take time to school. Specifically EA. Um, I am a yeah. bus driver. Uh, for example, yeah. I'll use another example where lack of consultation, um, consultation wasn't sought. I provided it but it was just ignored. Uh, I mentioned earlier about bus escorts. I think bus escorts have got the worst deal of all. For example, there could be a 33-seat bus with 32 pupils. I put forward uh, a couple of weeks ago that when they're picking up those 32 children, um, they should remain a, a seat free all around them and maintain at least a one meter distance then or just short of a one meter distance and to do that the bus just needs to pick up the first 27 pupils or 28 pupils because if you imagine a route the last pupils are going to be closest to the school go on into the school let the 27 pupils get off and then nip back out for the remaining four or five which would be a short journey and it was just flatly refused so, so you, made that, you made that suggestion yourself personally, didn't you? I made it through my regional secretary, who who, re, who did put it forward at, at uh, one of the meetings. Was this to the director of the, the, the responsible for transportation within the education authority? Yeah. 
Sorry, you uh, I, I made it to my regional secretary, trade union secretary. Yes, yes but the, the, to, the, to that person would then make it on to the, yeah. the director responsible yes. for transportation. Yes. And in terms of in terms of the cleaning, I think what we've heard about the cleaning uh, will will concern all members. Um, and uh, I mean, obviously there can't be depots at schools. Um, we appreciate that, and people have to deal with the the issues and 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 the, the constraints and the restraints that there are at this time. But I think the issue about cleaning is something which would also raise um, with the department and more specifically the EA, because you know obviously we would expect that um, the buses are cleaned. Uh, I, I I know that I've uh, had conversations with TransLink around the issue of the, the buses being cleaned. Uh, uh, in terms of their fleet, but we would expect the EA buses to be clean as well to, to address the issues that we all know are, are out there in terms of cleanliness being the major front line in, in opposing uh, and, and, and preventing the spread of this virus. Uh, Chair, that's me. Uh, thank you. Daniel McCrossan, MLA. Hello, Chair, and thank Uh, information that they have shared with us and for clarifying and confirming some of the concerns that have been raised by uh, me and other members of this committee right throughout what has been a very challenging uh, time, uh, certainly a challenging time for schools or teachers, principals, uh, non-teaching staff uh, as well uh, and continues to be. Uh, one of the most interesting comments that I've heard today was the concerns raised around uh, school cleaning. At the earliest stages of this pandemic, uh, uh, as a member of this committee, I raised directly with the Minister and with uh, the Permanent Secretary on numerous occasions uh, the serious concerns I had around school resources uh, or the lack of and the already pre-existing financial challenges faced by schools uh, prior to uh, COVID-19. That will absolutely be worsened as a consequence of the situation. Yes, albeit unprecedented, but it is worsened by the situation that we now find ourselves in. But at the earliest stages, we shared examples with the Minister and with the Permanent Secretary and indeed others uh, in EA, uh, Sarah Long and others, uh, that school cleaning would need to be a priority uh, because absolutely right throughout this entire process, we have been told, wash your hands continually, uh, keep your distance and so on and so forth. It just seems to me that given all the advice that we have received, and I'm saying this uh, uh, because I find it quite frustrating, but uh, throughout this entire pandemic, we've been told, wash your hands continually, uh, sing happy birthday twice in doing it and to ensure it's done thoroughly, uh, and also to ensure we keep our distance. Now, I'm absolutely supportive of children returning to schools, but it flies in the face of absolutely everything that we have been told by the by. Uh, Minister and others uh, for months, uh, and that was to keep our distance and to ensure our hands are washed. And, uh, the difficulty we have now is that we have children crammed into classrooms um, with no sufficient uh, resources for schools to ensure that they can ensure the safety of staff and pupils uh, throughout the school. Uh, and we're seeing uh, the uh, the impact that is having on morale, uh, particularly amongst the teaching and non-teaching workforce, because they're very, very concerned, as articulated by yourselves and the evidence you've given this morning. Uh, the, the difficulty I have is obviously even if you, if you take uh, uh, the issues around the return to schools, uh, something as simple as cleaning is absolutely vital because we've been told, even touching a surface, uh, a child or a teacher or a non-teaching member of staff can pick up the infection if the uh, surface isn't decontaminated uh, if, if it comes into contact with someone that is indeed infected. So even the simplest of things haven't happened. And I don't know what your own judgment is of how the minister or the department or EA have handled this entire process. I get, I get the sense from what you're saying because there's a lot of concerns. But in my opinion, they've handled this entire thing uh, terribly. It's been a disaster, in fact. And I'll go further. It does absolutely, it does absolutely confirm. Are with us next, so you, you will be able to put those level of concerns yeah. to them and just to encourage you to I'm, ask questions. I'm taking the opinion of, of, of the others that are here, Chair, just in relation to 
uh, the lack of fin- financial support and resources. And I know it's been laboured already, but I want, I, want, I want to just hear how important they believe that to be. Uh, and do they believe that the monies, although we haven't seen it actually come down to schools yet, is sufficient? Or is it simply a scratch the surface exercise, which I believe the sum allocated is? It, it, it'll go nowhere near where it needs to go in addressing some of the serious concerns in relation to financial shortcomings. I think, um, Mr. Crossan, the, the difficulty we have is we don't know how much funding is actually going to go to schools. And although the EA are saying that they haven't actually received any requests for additional cleaning, surely that should have been one of when they were writing the plan that the plan should have set out. Here's where the money and money should have been you know, put towards. So we don't have any idea whether that money will be sufficient or not, because we're not sure of the demand and whether or not schools have been asked for an estimate of how much additional cleaning they would need in order to be um, to make the, the schools safe. Um, I don't know if any of my other colleagues might want to come in and just add to that. Well, um, sorry, go ahead. Um. Uh, thank you, Alan. Uh, look, I think that the difficulty, difficulties we're, we're in arise from the fact that at the very outset, we probably got the strategic framework wrong. We um, took the leadership responsibilities of the uh, principals and built um, a response system from that top down. Didn't uh, build a team didn't do team working, uh, as I said earlier, in the schools and uh, involving all of the staff. And where you had on the health side, uh, the civil service policy leads developing the general policy, you had the hands-on practitioners with expertise across the health service. You don't have that in education. The leadership teams in education, they're educators. They educate in the classroom. And I think the missing link was health expertise guiding and developing that team working so that we would get it right on what we need on cleaning, on what you would need in terms of protection on the transport, of how classroom assistance and special needs uh, assistance in the classroom uh, setting, what they would need to do. So the missing link was uh, expertise and guidance with the health focus to assist the leadership teams in the schools. And I think there's a fundamental flaw in how we're continuing with that strategy. It's got to be changed. It's got to be amended. Now, I think the PHA have copped on and they've actually, as I said, and thank you, Member Humphreys, for, for responding to our suggestion that we, we, we become involved in, uh, in that dialogue. That strategy has, has got to be changed. And the EA, yes, as the employing authority, um, have responsibility to get this right and have made mistakes. There's no, no doubt about it. Uh, but we all need a mechanism now to, 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 to address those flaws, fill those gaps and get a new framework going where we're all better equipped uh, to deal with all of these issues. None of us um, have been here before, as I said, and there's going to be a lot of, a lot of learning on the way. Uh, and, and I think that's what's at the heart uh, of all of this uh, uh, and, and how we might. And Maxine, our chair there, called for a review. The review has to address uh, this question, and the sooner the better. Thank you. I think Denise raised her hand to come in at this point. Is that right, Denise? Yeah, and it's really just Anne's last point there, and that's what's critical. Um, the new school day has been released but we're now back at school it's not too late to make the effective changes that need to happen Um, and that's what we want we want to be able to play an active role in making sure that the return to school is successful and that it's safe Um, and so it is it's absolutely critical that the trade unions and that the people that are actually doing the jobs are now involved in that review and making those recommendations and having those recommendations acted on. Alan, you want to come in briefly as well there? 
Yes, I just wanted to comment on the financials around the cleaning uh, service because uh, Member McCrossan had re referenced it. Uh, the Minister announced an additional £7 million of funding, and that equates to just over £6,500 per school, um, approximately £34 per day. Now, that funding also has to cover the cost of the cleaning materials and any cleaning time. So, so there's actually very little capacity within the funding package to deliver much cleaning. It, it's going to be ended up with purchasing the materials that are required to sanitize and all the rest of it. So the, the funding package is broadly wholly inadequate to address the needs of uh, fighting this pandemic. Response? <laughs> Yeah, Chair, Chair that, that, that really does confirm uh, the, the core concern that I have in relation to allocated funding. Uh, and you've broken it down very nicely there and in, 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 in very worryingly, in fact, £34.8, nowhere near sufficient at all. Uh, we'd be lucky to cater for uh, half a classroom, let alone uh, for uh, an entire school, particularly given the size of some of the schools that we have. So there is a very serious issue here in terms of a lack of resources to support uh, our schools throughout this and guidance yes is absolutely necessary and we can have all the guidance in the world but if we haven't got the financial uh, if we haven't got the funds to support our teachers uh, and our non-teaching staff in schools to ensure safety of teachers and pupils and non-teaching staff then we're wasting our time uh, and I do uh, take on board absolutely the need for us all to work together to find solutions to the complex problems that exist I do but I do have a real concern that the Department of Education the Minister and the Education Authority are just not listening and that is very clear from a lot of the uh, uh, issues that have arisen over the course of this pandemic because there's some great advice and guidance and concerns raised by the likes of yourselves as the unions by teachers themselves non-teaching staff MLAs indeed as well and it has all been ignored and the flawed consultation process and the reopening of schools rightly proves that it has been flawed uh, and, and that is what gives me great concern it's it's okay of us all discussing these issues, but if the department and the minister and the EA aren't willing to listen, then how are we going to get this right in the interest of the safety of our children, young people, and absolutely our staff uh, within our school environment? That's the core concern that I have. But I, th I want to thank you for the evidence that you've given. I think it's vitally important uh, that we hear that, and certainly uh, in how you've articulated uh, down to the, the, the solid numbers of, of what exists. Uh, there is a, a severe worry there, and I just want to leave you on this question. In terms of the, mem the members, uh, respectively, that uh, you represent, how concerned would you say they are about the lack of resources and the risk exposed to them uh, by a lack of resources in these schools in the, in the circumstances which we're in in terms of restart? I think you need to remember that our members have children in schools too. So our, our members are concerned because they work in the school environment, so they're concerned for their own health and well-being, but they're also concerned for their own children. And everyone wants to see uh, schools reopening and reopening in a successful manner. But what we are seeing is that, uh, well, the department threw out the best plans that we had uh, available to us and decided to go with the approach that everybody should be back from day one. And we think that's just going to lead to the, the chaos that uh, unfortunately we're starting to see. That point, can I bring Robbie Butler in, please? Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you all for all of your input so far. And the members have covered probably most of, of what you've brought to us. And I think we this, this committee and every one of the members has has, has spoken on much many uh, much and many of um, those issues. Um, I think it was Alan at the start had said about some of the unhelpful rhetoric uh, around and, their, and, and, and our teachers, our head teachers and our support staff and parents who are sending their, their kids back are faced with a dilemma because you have uh, people who are in position who are COVID deniers, shall we say, and there's a, there's a plethora of, of unhelpful information out there. And then we have a lack of useful information to, to draw um, useful and safe plans of operation to, to have our pupils back. Um, uh, there's, a, there's a little story goes about sometimes about how important it was to have the space shuttle cleaned before it was launched and the person whose probably job was the single most important one up to launch was the person who went in and cleaned the, the space shuttle and, and, and rid it of dust and all of the things that might interfere with a successful and safe launch and I think COVID has, has, has given us one of those um, examples again where um, for our 
for us to achieve having our kids back in the school safely, we need to be making sure that absolutely everything is as good as it can be. And obviously the resources, the budget and the plan is not necessarily as robust as it can be. I think we're all uh, agreed on that. Um, I think what you guys have done today ha has been to give a really good voice for those support workers who we are very grateful for. Um, because I, I know of stories, um, if you look just in Dol me, Chair, of, of cleaners in, in local primary schools, for instance, who go way beyond that role. They actually perform, because they have a heart for children, they perform an, an extra role, as do the helpers and drivers on the buses that don't just carry out the function that they're there to be paid to do. They have that pastoral piece, which is given uh, free gratis. And as Daniel pointed out, hygiene is what has been driven into us is going to be the number one combatant of COVID, washing our hands, sneezing into our elbows, social distancing and so on. And those things are a challenge in schools, especially with young children, because very often if a child is unsettled um, and coming into the school, especially for a new start, the, the, the thing that you want to do is get close to the child, maybe put them on your knee and, and, and give them uh, that little bit of reassurance. And, and that leads me into my first point, and that is the risk assessments. Um, and I think it was, uh, I think perhaps, yeah, Thomas, it was yourself who, who picked it up nicely. I think the department have, have provided, I think, four templates of potential risk assessments that can be used, which I, I understand the need for uh, flexibility. Um, but when you outline the fact that um, some of our support staff can be cleaning, then they can be cooking, and then they can be maybe even providing a classroom assistant role, um, I can't think, and I, and I carried out many, many, many risk assessments in the operational sense and in the, in the managerial sense, how complex that is and, and why the, the resource and the support um, is, is lacking um, at the moment. I think that perhaps is probably the most important thing that we're missing here, is that risk assessment piece and the, and the, the confirmation that we can't pick up the complexities um, within, within that. Um, with regard to, Thomas, if I can just go on, on, on the buses because of, of, of a number of constituents who are, are seriously worried about their, their kids travelling in the buses. Um, with that. So you can confirm that the buses are in, in full, at full capacity. Mostly, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and is that is that the is that what's happening? Obviously, we've only, we're only a couple of days in, but have you found that there's any reluctance from parents to to use the buses? Or I have thirty seven pupils on my main run. Okay. I split in two, uh, and I've only had one parent who has said to me, "Look, I'm going to wait until October to see how it goes." A full bus. The rest are all on. I think you'd illustrate it's a, it's a full bus up to 37 kids. The driver. Has I have 37 on the, on the run, but it's sort of like 25 and or 12. Just depending on the runs, it's, it's split in two. Yeah, and the helper will obviously be in. I don't have one. Don't have one. That's 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 tough. Yeah. yeah. That's tough. Yeah. Okay, so I'm sure the, the, the committee will, will pick that up. Um, uh, and I'm just going to just one more. Um, sure, I haven't got too many questions asked because I think the information was given. But what I did really, really like. Um, it was Denise was, was talking, um, talked about the additional hours, but then she said about the mental health of pupils and staff, and that's something that we talk about regularly, about the mental health of our pupils, and, and it's, a, it's a priority for this committee. I know that, and it was good that it wasn't, uh, it wasn't overlooked today. Um, so I could ask anybody maybe to come in and speak on that in terms of any feedback you're getting from your members with regard to the increased anxiety that's on them, because um, as adults, it's really important that, that, that we confer... Um, on to our, the young people in our schools, that sense of confidence, but if we're struggling ourselves and, and we're suffering in that way. So could, could anybody maybe just talk a little bit about any um, examples that they've got coming to them from their members? Could I just say, I'm a, a lay rep, workplace rep, and in the week after the Minister's announcement of, I think it was around about 12th of August, the, 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 the full school restart was announced and in that following week, <coughs> it was becoming clear social distancing on buses was basically scrapped. Uh, it was becoming clear that it, that included, I mean, my initial would have been in, well, at least the, the, the escort would still have a metre distance. Uh, that was being scrapped as well. We were basically untold, no, everyone's on, just off you go. My phone. And I'm, I'm not exaggerating when I say it's from morning till night, and when I say night, maybe 10 o'clock, for the full week in, in the run-up to the 17th, um, never stopped. Between ringing and text messages, 
and simply from members who are worried and concerned. And risk assessments was a, the main mm. issue. Quite a few underland conditions. Uh, a few weeks um, earlier, there were classes clinically vulnerable. Um, now, clinically vulnerable was the answer to that was, well, we're not shielding anymore, so off you go. So essentially, we're being told the generic risk assessment will do you. You don't need an individual risk assessment. Um, so there was a lot of, there, and still is, a lot of anxiety, a lot, a lot of worry. And as I say, the, 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 you know, the age group of our, our workers and escorts, you know, it's, it, they're not all, we're not all spring chickens anymore. It's, it's an old, you know, uh, I don't know if use the word old. We're older, you know. We're, we're all getting old. <laughs> <laughs> nice vintage. Just on that, I think all of our membership were very concerned, as I already have pointed out and you've just alluded to. 31st of July, a lot of them were shielding, and then come the 17th, they were back to school. And I mean, <coughs> I know on one day we had 115 emails from our membership with regard to the return to school and their concerns. And I think one of the issues as well is, and someone made the point earlier, a lot of our, our membership, a lot of them are also parents or grandparents, and we all know how grandparents feel about their grandchildren. Mm -hmm. you know, and there's a lot of concern and anxiety. But I know that our, all of our, um, our, the people who work within education have been doing their very best to reduce the anxiety for the young people and for the pupils because they know that they, don't, they need them to be settled in order to be able to learn. And I think a lot of the, the if you, you know, there was articles you know, June time, where it was sort of basically we need to get our young people back and get them settled again before we can even start them on that learning journey. And I think that has been a lot of people have sort yes, we are anxious, yes, we have anxieties, but we need our children to be settled in order for them to learn. So I think <coughs> a lot of people that has been, even though they have their own anxieties, they've been doing their very best to hide that from, I suppose, the children, but it's still there. Um, um, can I just ask then, it's, it's a collective voice then, um, it, given that the, if the resources were there and there was, a, there was an agreement and through consultation that the risk assessments were understandable, appropriate and, and the indemnity was there too because it's a difficult time, you would agree that, that, that our kids need to be back in the school but, but the resources and stuff aren't there at the moment and the guidance, which is what the teaching unions have basically been saying to us too. Um, and in a very short time, we need to see that, that consultation between the department and, um, and yourselves to be... I, th I think the, the problem we have is that in June we all thought we were going back to this phased return where there would be and we would work through that in order to get people back and we all would have felt a lot more confident with those lesser numbers in and I think that would have helped us build our confidence. But we, lit we went from that to basically a full return within a very short period of time and as we've said the guidance is, you know, as we've said there, it, it, the guidance is not really fit for purpose and not fit for us to be able to return our children safely to school. There's a lot of anxieties around it. Okay, thank, thank you, Chair. Thanks, Rowley. Can I bring in Catherine Kelly, MLA? Catherine? Catherine, can you hear us okay? Um, yeah. th thank you, Chair, and, and thanks everyone for your very informative contributions this morning. Um, I don't think that we are in any doubt about how vital all of our school staff are um, to the lives of our children. Um, their roles are paramount, and especially now um, as schools have returned. Um, Thomas, you have talked about school transport um, and with first-hand experience. Um, we've seen serious issues last week um, in relation to school transport. Um, the EA bus drivers fearing for the safety of children and themselves on buses which were not yet ready. Have EA engaged with the unions about these serious concerns? Um, they speeded up the process of putting up driver screens um, in relation to consultation in my experience, not really. It's just, it was just, I mean, there, there has been meetings. I can't say, you know, I have to be honest, I ha wasn't at those meetings, so I can't say uh, in detail. Um, but there was a, a, a slight speed up in putting the physical protection in, as in the cab screens. Um, but again, I would just allude to the fact that hand sanitizer dispensers, cab screens, 
There's a shortage of PPE even last week. Uh, when I received my own PPE, I received about 50% of it. Um, but these were measures that even if we'd co come back to a phased return, these measures would have been needed to be in place anyway. So we, we're at a loss as to why this is all happening at last minute. Really, really, really are. Thanks, thanks a lot, Thomas. Um, and just on the, you also mentioned earlier, um, the fact that there are many um, dedicated uh, transport drivers who are have underlying health issues. Um, and you know, are you aware of the shortage of bus drivers currently, or do you foresee this happening due to outstanding safety issues? Didn't quite catch full of that. Is there a shortage of drivers? Or, yeah, yeah, yeah. How's it? Yeah. Not that I know of. Um, well, so, sorry, I did in, in our own area, uh, in Lisburn there, I know there was two drivers had to be brought in, a telephone call on Friday to come in on Monday, because there were going to be two drivers short, and that was just in, in, in Lisburn area. Um, due to vulnerability, um, I don't know of, of any who are who have had the risk assessments done um, and been told they can't return. I think the cab screen has played a big part because with it being in place, um, essentially, well, I myself, for example, would have been underland condition, but without, with the cab screen there, um, I feel safe. I'm totally protected uh, and I don't need to wear a mask or anything because of glasses, etc. The screens possibly were, I believe, were a major issue. EA obviously still feel not, and that they still would say, we're doing you a favour. Yeah, especially, Thomas, when that was something that should have been brought in um, the weeks beforehand, and it shouldn't have taken um, bus drivers to, you know, lay, set down their tools, close the bus door, um, and for, for it to actually be put into place. Um, just lastly, Chair, um, are you satisfied that the transport gains for special schools is enough? Um, is it enough? Uh, we believe, I mean, I would say the, the, uh, the PPE the advisors were given were quite, well, they're, they're, let's just put it, I was in the principal's office last week and I've seen some PP being used by school staff and I wouldn't put it in the same quality. Um, I believe the social distancing should be involved in the special needs bus. Um, but again, it's been... It's, we're, we're told that's scrapped as well. So basically, if the if the if the bus will take two wheelchairs and seven pupils, plus the escort, then that's what it'll take. Um, I've concerns about that. Okay, Catherine. Thanks, Chair. Thank okay. you, Thomas. Alan, do you want to come in very briefly? We're we're well over time now. Yeah, absolutely. And I, ju I just thought it would be important maybe to um, refocus some of the discussion because. Uh, you know, the, the issues that uh, have been referred to in relation to transport, we have equally the same concerns for the class-based staff, particularly the classroom assistants, who, who work very closely with the, the children and young people. Uh, we, we don't believe there's adequate thought given to the, the need for them to maintain some sort of distance and also deliver their job. And, and that's something that really concerns us. We had our first meeting with the EA in relation to classroom assistance on the 28th of August, and we've been asking for that for weeks. And, and that was only to discuss the risk assessments and some of the schools already opened. So, you know, the, the thought given to this and the fact that we've had schools closed for months uh, just seems to be all a very last minute uh, approach when we think there was ample time to put in place proper processes in a timely fashion. Can I bring in Morris Bradley and then Justin McNulty to finish? Morris. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Uh, 
Just a few points, Chair. Most, most of the things have been covered, and I thank everybody uh, very much for their presentation this morning. It's been very informative. Uh, Anne suggested a team approach. I would agree with that. Such an approach should be developed, and would also agree that any such body should have trade union representation within any committee that may be set up. Denise made a reference to a task force. I would ask Denise, if possible, how she would envisage such a task force strategy could be rolled out across different school settings. But I'd like to take up Thomas's points on bus cleaning and sanitising, uh, not just for the yellow bus fleet, but also TransLink private operators and uh, private taxi operators where they are taking children to school and picking up children from school. If there is a risk to drivers and where applicable bus escorts, I think the DA, DE and EA should be expanding the financial package provided to TransLink to cover the yellow buses and private operators also, uh, something I have brought up before. Uh, the need to fit protective cab screens between drivers and passengers is, is, uh, is um, I think, something that should happen at the very least. As you have alluded to, Thomas, uh, I, I'm one of those categories that has to shield and have been shielding. Uh, drivers generally are, are of a certain age. Many, I would assume, have been shielding until recently. Uh, and measures should be a priority, priority to ensure drivers are safe, bus guest, escorts are safe, and passengers are safe. Would you agree with this approach? And perhaps could you advise me if it would be possible to set up a partnership with TransLink to use their external bus washing facilities where they are available? Thomas, if you want to say anything else in relation to the transport issues that Morris has raised, and then we'll bring in Denise briefly on the task force question. Um, in relation to the bus cleaning and a, and a partnership with TransLink, um, some areas do do have that in that we can go in and use the the drive through really. So it's really just the exterior of the bus, and again, they're not one hundred percent brilliant simply because the size of the bus aren't as big as the the uh, the TransLink ones. So the, the bus are sort of half done, you could say, or three quarters done. Um, I would I would agree that there needs to be some sort of package set aside for uh, the cleaning regimes because it really is farcical. Um, we're being asked, we're being given a cleaning regime which we just can't carry out, and when when we're questioned about it, to our sort of immediate line managers, all we're getting really is a shrug of the shoulders. That, that's it. It's, I don't think I've ever heard or seen the shrug of the shoulders as much in my life as I have done this past two weeks. Yeah, I think that, that is definitely an issue that we will want to raise. Denise, do you want to respond to Marcia's question with regards to the task force? Yeah, I see it very much as linking in to the one school approach that Anne discussed. So it shouldn't be down to just the principals in the school to determine what, what the best practices are. Uh, certainly they've got the overall responsibility. Um, but what we need to see is that they take on board the advice from the catering lead, the cleaning lead, the classroom assistance lead and the, the admin um, staff leads. Um, but we're becoming aware of... Um, uh, link officers, I think they're called, which are, um, I think, I'm not sure whether they're employed by the department or by the education authority. And they have the responsibility of liaising with um, a number of, of schools in a locality. Again, that um, that role can be enhanced, if you like, so that we, we do have a collective so that where things are happening within given areas or given locations, that we have very quickly got a team up and running which can look at each of the different sectors. Um, you know, and as I said earlier, one of the issues for us is if you look at the, the support staff within the school, many of them and the vast majority of them actually carry out multiple functions because the roles are maybe only for five in the, in the case of cleaners, they could be employed for anything between five and 15 hours a week. Lunchtime supervisors, it's two and a half to five hours a week. So people take on multiple roles in order to make a living. So it's, it's vitally important that we get an understanding from the people that do the jobs, 
what the best approach and what the safest approach is. Um, I'm a firm believer that those that do the job generally have the solutions. Uh, but again, it goes back to the guidance and that's an awful lot of what we've seen with the transport issues that um, Thomas has highlighted because it says it's more practical. The guidance isn't clear. It doesn't say you must, you need, this is a requirement. Um, so that's, that's where things need to be tightened up. And again, the task force should, should be looking at strengthening um, the review and making sure that it's fit for purpose. Okay, thank you very much. Questions, Morris, okay for me to move on? Yeah, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Morris. Justin McNulty. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Alan, Anne, Denise, uh, Thomas, and Maxine for your presentations. Um, I can feel the anxiety, the worry, concern, and fear from your presentations. Um, and that's a fraught situation for you and your members. Um, touching on what Robbie has touched on earlier, um, I know this will have an impact on the mental health of all of your members. And um, I admire the fortitude, the determination of your members to um, still do best by, by the children and young people they're seeking to have uh, play their part in, in their education. The one team strategy that you mentioned, Alan, in relation to schools, I think you're broadening that outside the schools to the department, the PHA, the Education Authority and the unions to have all those people involved in making decisions and, and guiding pathway forward and I think what the problems have arisen from the compartment compartmentalization of each of those units where as you know the people on the ground know best and they shall be involved in decision making um, I know teachers principals classroom assistants caterers transport uh, teams are all passionate about the vital roles they play in educating children and young people and it's a, it's a huge concern that six months into this pandemic you and your members feel that the guidance is vague and ambiguous. Um, the term more practical cannot fill anybody with any confidence. Um, it's, a, it's a huge concern that insufficient funding is there to provide for adequate cleaning regimes for schools, for buses, um, and for the necessary risk assessments to have been completed. A question for Thomas in relation to risk assessments, in relation to vulnerable pupils or shielding pupils. What is the guidance you have received and your members have received for children who may be vulnerable using buses? Next to nothing. Um, our members, if with a vulnerable child, um, specifically vulnerable because obviously special needs school, uh, buses, are, you can argue that all of them are, are vulnerable. Um, but any with specific issues, uh, our members are generally having to go back to uh, the senior driver and point it out and ask for a risk assessment um, done on that on that particular child. Um, the office would probably say, no, we have done one, but we're not allowed to discuss it with GDPR. That's essentially what we would get. Is that a concern? Is it concerning? Or, uh, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, uh, we believe that, that we should, you know, the, the, the escort and driver should be involved. I mean, if, if there are concerns on, on that bus, the driver and escort should, should be aware of what to be watching for, etc. Hugely worrying, hugely worrying. To what extent do your members feel that uh, principals who are making decisions around uh, funding, about cl cleaning regimes, about extra staff, not having the money available to them now, but they're forging ahead in the hope that the finances will be made available down the road? To what extent do you feel that your principals or, or leaders are making those decisions at this point? Just, just on that, just I mean, as we have set out here today, is we do. Our concern is that they, because they haven't been allocated any additional funding, and they did receive a letter from the minister to say there wouldn't be any additional funding, which was already a very finite amount of funding. That we do believe that they are making decisions because they cannot, they don't want to go into a deficit. 
because then if there's a deficit, then they'll be looking, they'll be under pressure from the education authority to bring their funding under control. And to do that, what do you do? You cut some of the services that you're providing. So that could be you'll end up cutting your your cleaning further, or you'll cut your a teacher further. So there's always those concerns for principals in running our schools. My, my, my question was the opposite. Uh, to what extent were principals going ahead and spending the money, not having it, I'm not, in the anticipation that they would, it would be made available to them? Yeah, I'm not aware of, st of schools that are spending in the hope that it will be made aware, because they're always very wary until the money is actually with them, and they will be criticised by Education Authority if they do spend money. Now, I know that you had indicated you were potentially aware of schools that were heading, you know, were spending on, on the view, but I'm not aware of anyone. I'm not sure if any of my old colleagues want to come in on that. Um, yeah, just one point. Um, I did touch on it earlier, but we have seen cleaning services reduced over the last number of years. So just even maintaining the status quo is not an option. Um, you know, one of the things that we've dealt with over the last three, four years because of school budgets is a reduction in the number of cleaning hours that have been available. Um, and I'm sure Anne would would back me up on that but it is one of the areas that when school budgets come under pressure it's it's the services that our members that um provide that are that are those that generally are the areas that are squeezed um so it is it, it is a concern to us that um the cleaning budgets are not sufficient to, ca to carry out the needs of the the school environment or to keep the school environment as healthy and as clean as it should be Okay, just the last question. Do you have any information coming back at this point in relation to parents making decisions about not sending their children to school? I know it's early days, or staff saying, listen, I'm not, I don't feel safe, I, I, I can't come in. What sort of information, anecdotal or otherwise, do you have in relation to that potentially happening? Uh, anecdotally, we have been asked a number of times around what happens if a child does not go in. So there are a number of different of parents who have made the decision not, their not to return their child to school. Now in the, the the new school day guidance it does talk about that there will be further guidance issued around home working and you know sending work home, which hasn't been issued as yet. So but there anecdotally yes there has been a number. The numbers I'm not aware of. Okay. Thank you very much guys. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Justin um, the chair has just had a step out there. So that brings us to the end of our session and I really want to thank all of you, each and every one of you for coming here today. Um, it's just, as we said the last time, a bit unfortunate maybe that we didn't get to some couple of weeks before with everything that's going on. Our next session is with the Department and EA and I'm sure that all of this will be raised with all, with all of us here. So thank you very much okay. everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I think we'll be excellent. Yeah. Okay, can I ask Assembly Broadcasting um, sorry, uh, to remove all witnesses and I'll add all of the members back into the spotlight? And can I ask the clerk to summarise any other actions or requests uh, resulting from the briefing? Clark? Okay, thanks, Chairperson. Just want to make sure members are back in. Um, so uh, I think uh, this is the part, um, as members are aware, when um, I'll summarise what I think members said and then they can put me right. Uh, so I think uh, Mr Humphrey made an important point about writing to the Public Health Agency and suggesting to them that all relevant trade union representatives be involved in the development of public health guidance for schools. Um, I think perhaps also the committee may wish to um, okay, write to the department um, and then maybe take on what uh, Nick Ictu had said and suggest that there should be a understandable review mechanism for the guidance to schools where they could resolve differences and inconsistencies and to include Nick Ictu um, in that. Um, additionally then, I'd ask the department to clarify on the budget for cleaning. And we know there's a budget for restart, which is 35 million, but how much of that is going to be for cleaning. Um, then additionally, uh, to uh, maybe write to the Education Authority, um, suggesting to them that they revise the cleaning protocol for schools and buses, and in doing that revising, they speak to Nick Ektu to make sure that it actually makes sense, and in the process to flush out what this additional demand for cleaning is likely to be in schools, 
um, and, uh, and then sort of marry that up with the, the money from the department. And to also clarify around the availability of masks for school transport, that one week's worth, which was, was mentioned, and also for them to confirm that there will be guidance for, special guidance for classroom assistance um, uh, in terms of the you know, public health considerations. <coughs> so members, that was all I got. If there's something missing there, members will indicate, Chair. Yeah, members, anything to add? Sure. Uh, yeah, William, yeah. Can I just come in there? Yeah, go ahead, William. Thank you. Um, I think um, Morris Bradley's point is an interesting point in relation to the um, the fact that a lot of the buses are, are, are obviously TransLink buses and some of them private operators. And private operator, operators are somewhat different, but TransLink is obviously uh, a government-owned body. I'm wondering if there is... Perhaps there is, but maybe it didn't come across there to me. Uh, um, can there be a better um, synergy and joined upness between TransLink and the EA around some of those issues? Because obviously, uh, TransLink is solely there to provide transportation and will have resources for its buses that the EA will not have. And I'm just wondering if there's we can encourage whether it's writing to the EA or writing to the chief executive of TransLink. Mr. Conway, to encourage a greater joined upness between those two organisations around transportation. We can do that, William. We also have Education Authority with us, um, with the department in our next session here as well. So perhaps yeah. yourself and Morris yeah. might want to raise those particular questions with uh, yeah. Dale Hanna at the Education Authority here. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Good job. Thank you, William. Any other members? No. Oh, intent to agree. Uh, the, the, the clerk's suggestions, agreed? And Williams as well. Uh, and Williams' additional suggestion, agreed? Yep. Okay. 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 Thank you, members. Okay. Can I ask Assembly Broadcasting to remove all members uh, who are not in room 30 from the spotlight and to add officials who have dialed in for agenda item 6, uh, school restart briefing from the Department of Education and the Education Authority, and hopefully welcome John Smith, Deputy Secretary of the Department of Education, Adrian Murphy, Head of Area Planning, North Region, and Michelle Courtney, Education Authority, and Dale Hanna of the Education Authority. Can I advise witnesses that proceedings will be reported by Hansard and refer members to their PACs? Page 35 includes a covering note from the clerk, 46, sets out recent committee correspondence to the department responses of which are at page 9 of tabled items. Pages 50 and 54 provide updated the guidance for special schools and preschools. Page 138 gives correspondence from schools and individuals in respect of restart and also transfer test issues. And I remind officials that the evidence uh, session will be reported by Hansard and invite our officials to make an opening statement. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, is the acoustics okay? Can you hear me? We can, yes. Thank you. So um, I'm going to give you a, a brief opening statement in terms of the restart programme. And obviously, uh, you heard from the Minister a couple of weeks ago uh, on, on the new school day guidance. And uh, here today, just to, to brief you on, on some of the broader aspects of what we've been doing uh, over the summer period. Um, you'll be aware that we've divided the restart program into a number of priorities and I will just take them uh, briefly in turn. Um, in terms of physical protection, uh, we're working really closely with the Education Authority to ensure that the risk of, of COVID transmission is, is, is minimised and obviously that um, includes making sure that there's enough cleaning equipment and hygiene and, and PPE uh, available to all schools uh, as appropriate uh, when they need it. The wellbeing strand, um, we proposed, uh, published um, updated guidance on supporting staff to return to school on the 10th of August, and that was to support principals and line managers for when they're bringing staff back into the workplace. And you'll also be aware that Prior to COVID, we've been working collaboratively with a number of other government departments on the framework for children and young people's emotional health and well-being. 
Um, that work is still progressing and the main emphasis of that is to support schools to promote emotional health and well-being at a universal level and we're hoping to complete that work uh, by the end of this calendar year. We're doing all we can to support pupils as they return to school this week. The uh, well-being section of the EA website has been updated and there's a multidisciplinary helpline that's being set up and there's a compendium of resources available on the EA website to, to, to help schools and, and pupils in that regard. Turning to the new school day guidance, obviously um, you heard comprehensively from uh, the Minister and officials a couple of weeks ago on that. Um, we published our revised guidance on the 13th of August. Um, you know, keen to point out though that, that whilst we developed that at pace, uh, it was a culmination of uh, three months of effort involving ourselves and the PHA, the practitioners group and representatives of trade union side. Um, we don't view the publication of that revised guidance as being the end of the process and, and we do want to pick up again over the forthcoming weeks with the practitioners group and trade unions and managing authorities to work through some of the operational aspects of uh, of that guidance in the coming weeks. Um, as I say, it's, it's, it's not the end of a process, um, it's very much um, ongoing. In terms of support for vulnerable pupils, um, across the summer you'll be aware that we, we provided funding for approximately 50 summer schools to enable pupils to take part in a range of activities, get them socialising again, learning and, and having fun. We purchased virtual uh, learning resources online for children that are going into P7 to help them with literacy and numeracy. We're currently developing the Engage programme, which will help all pupils, um, but particularly those from disadvantaged backgrounds who would benefit most from some additional support to engage with their learning uh, following, the, uh, following the lockdown and the return to schools. And you'll also be aware that from May 2020, we've been lending digital devices to uh, vulnerable and disadvantaged young people to help them learn from home. And that program has continued across the summer and there'll be many thousands of digital devices that have been delivered to date and will continue to roll out that, that uh, provision of devices throughout September. <coughs> In terms of standards and learning, we published guidance to help schools on their curriculum planning um, because schools will be needed to consider how they tailor and adapt their curriculum delivery uh, for this academic year. And the, in terms of the Education Authority, their supporting learning web pages have been revised to take account of Restart. More recently, you'll be aware that SIA has published a two-week consultation on the arrangements for next year's qualifications and they're publishing proposals about how they might adapt the GCSE, AS and A-level qualifications to take account of the current public health position. And the proposals will also seek to address lost learning time and aim to reduce the burden of assessment on, on young people. Obviously, everyone wants clarity on these arrangements for next year as soon as possible but it is important that SIA uh, take time to reflect on the lessons learned from, from the last three to six months uh, and ensure that the proposals that they bring forward take account of the challenges facing young people. So we encourage young people, teachers, parents and school leaders to, to, to take part in the consultation and, and put their views in to SIA. Turning to the childcare work stream, um, the recovery scheme was launched on the 27th of July after the executive agreed a £10.5 million package of support and that covers the period which expired uh, 1st of July to the 31st of August. The closing date for applications is the 11th of September and to date the indications are strong uptake of the scheme. About 70% of the fund has already been allocated to providers. Clearly, schools have returned uh, in full, full-time for all pupils this week. 
And I just want to briefly outline some of the support arrangements that we've put in place for schools uh, to help them as they, as, they, as they get back up to speed. Um, in terms of the Education Authority, um, we've established a link, a, a, a network of link officers. Um, they, in fact, have been in place from when we uh, were in phase one of the, of the lockdown of schools. But those link officers are still in place and they're, they're really designed as a first point of contact for school principals in terms of any issues or, or points of clarification in terms of um, restarting their schools or the new school day guidance. We've got that backed up with a, a dedicated restart helpline under the Education Authority and there's also resources on, on the Education Authority's website in terms of frequently asked questions. And the EA has also established a COVID-19 helpline, which is for schools to phone um, if there have been uh, a, a confirmed case of COVID in their schools. As I said, the link officers will remain in place for the foreseeable future and act as the lead contact. Uh, and hopefully that means that queries and, and problems and issues can be resolved uh, quickly. The Minister wrote directly to all parents on the 13th of August and in addition to that um, the department's website has a section for parents and carers which we've developed uh, and there's lots of resources on there that are available uh, through the DE website. Um, I should say that um, just recently uh, we have established even closer links with our colleagues in the Department of Health to the extent that we are meeting twice a week with the Chief Medical Officer and the Chief uh, Executive of the PHA and their deputies to really keep a close eye on, on issues that need to be resolved as schools return so that we can resolve any problems as quickly as we can uh, in an operational sense. So that's a brief overview of, of uh, progress over the last number of months and we're happy to take questions. Okay, thanks very much indeed. Uh, John, um, can, I, can I ask respectfully why the Minister and the Permanent Secretary aren't able to attend the committee today, given the context that we're in? That's a, a pre-book diary commitment, um, Chair, um, and, and uh, that's all there is to it on that one. To detail to the committee what those pre-book diary commitments were in order to assess the prioritisation of those pre-book diary commitments over addressing the education committee the, the week that schools started back further to a COVID-19 lockdown? Certainly we can come back to you on that, Chair. Okay, that's greatly appreciated. Um, I just have a few questions and I, I'm keen to make sure that we get all members in and that we ask as many questions um, as possible. But um, can, can I ask, uh, give the department an opportunity to, um, to really emphasise home the messaging for schools and parents around what the precise symptoms are under which uh, a pupil would not attend school and would self-isolate at home? Um, <clears throat> Chair, I'll cover that. Um, it's a, a, a continuous cough that lasts for more than an hour, an hour, or a high temperature, or a loss of taste. It's the standard definition of uh, symptoms that are within the public health guidance on the public health agency, and that's used across the UK. Uh, this does not include the typical sniffles and snuffles uh, that will come from a cold. Uh, that in particular, the coughing has to be a long and persistent cough. Uh, and those are the symptoms and the, uh, the basis of what we are using to uh, manage and control the system. Okay, and w once um, quarantined at home, the procedure is for the pupil to seek a, a test as promptly as possible? Uh, sorry, Chair, you, I just didn't quite get Sorry, can, can I also give the opportunity to set out what the process then is for testing? Okay, uh, in, in terms of testing, I, I think that you have to be mindful of two processes. One, uh, if, you're in, if you as an individual are already at home and feel that you have symptoms of a high temperature or cough or a loss of taste, then uh, with, with 
anybody who's symptomatic, they are able to book through their test using going through either the, the public health agency website or going contacting through the 111 number. They will book that test and it's usually available on the day or within 24 hours and they'll get a result within 12 to 24 hours. In terms of the testing and tracing then of, of, of dealing with a, a child who is in school and shows symptoms, um, we, the position is a, a standard public health agency guidance uh, for any contagious disease or uh, virus is that you would isolate the child to protect both them and the rest of the wider school population. And there's guidance within the uh, new school day um, guidance in terms of how that should be operated. It's fairly standard that you would isolate them, you'll take care of them, uh, and maintain uh, supervision of them and look for them to be brought home as soon as possible. No different than it would be if a case of somebody breaking an ankle or whatever else within school, you will look after them until a parent comes home. And, and uh, pupil is, is, uh, in cor is quarantined and receives confirmation of a positive test. What does that mean for other pupils that may have been in contact with that pupil and what indeed is the definition of contact? The definition of contact used by PHA is a, a contact that is less than two metres for a sustained period and which is around 15 minutes. Uh, that's a definite contact that's been used throughout uh, the UK. So if a, if a pupil uh, either at home or, in, or after school uh, comes with a positive test, uh, the uh, head teacher will be asked in ter terms of who are the contacts, who are the classmates of that child, and will be asked to provide that information to the public health agency's test and trace uh, system. Uh, in the end, the test and trace system who decide who are contacts based on speaking to the uh, either the teacher or classroom assistant or the, to the individual, uh, and they will then follow that test and trace process to contact those individuals. In the interim, uh, you know, there is a time lag between when a parent might uh, contact the school to say, uh, my son or daughter has, has tested positive and the test and trace system in coming into place. And in the interim, the school uh, is likely to be advised to uh, precautionary uh, um, recommendation to self-isolate the entire class uh, to make sure that all of the possible contacts uh, are um, urge to self-isolate and that the risk of transmission is minimised. If a uh, test is positive, um, or sorry, if a test is negative, um, does a pupil or indeed a staff member still be required to quarantine for the 14-day period? My understanding is there's um, some confusion around that. If, some if, communication if, if, is if, suggesting if, if, if that a, a negative if result somebody has symptoms. To uh, uh, and uh, the rest of their family, at that point, they and their family should self isolate in, in, in line with the public health agency guidance. If, if they go and get a test and it's negative and there's no other symptoms within the family and, and or their family members have also got negative tests, then it quite clearly, clearly is not COVID. Uh, you know, everybody's got a negative test. It's another virus, it's a flu, it's a cold, it's a whatever. And then assuming people are well and have no further high temperatures or other symptoms, then they are well enough to go back to work. And that's generally, the, the guidance currently says 48 hours, uh, and that's just a general, you, you know, you can return back to, to school and to work when you're healthy uh, after you get a negative test. The position is different, however. If the position, sorry. Yeah, the position is different here where you have, you're defined as a contact of someone who is positive. So if your phone dings and tells you that you've been a contact or the contact tracing come in and in, in start contacting you, well then it is a definite case of COVID and the recommendation and the public health agency guidance is that you and all your family members, um, whether you're symptomatic or not, should have a 14 day self-isolation period. And that's because that allows the breaking of the transmission of the virus Obviously, we don't want people to be self-isolating if they suspect they have a virus and it actually turns out to be a common cold or, or some other uh, sort of ongoing um, uh, bout of sickness. Yeah, that, that's, that's helpful clarification. Um, there, there does seem to be general feedback um, from principals and parents that accessing timely advice and guidance has been extremely challenging and indeed 
uh, a number of uh, teaching and non-teaching representative bodies have called for bespoke outlines for principals and parents. Um, what is the department's response to those requests? Um, the, the, guidance, the position here is that the, the public health agency should be contacted only when there's a confirmed case. Uh, that's, that's their resolute retro. <coughs> they want to deal with the management of confirmed cases. Uh, they do not have the resource capacity to deal with general inquiries uh, or advice from either parents or principals. And in fact, when principals and parents do so, uh, they, you know, they, they are sort of uh, clogging up the lines, as it were, for genuine cases and, and, and holding back the work of the PHA. And that's why in the interim, um, the guidance will be for teachers to look for guidance and information through their link officers. Who, who will be trained up and who are be, who have already been um, taken through the new school day guidance and all the public health guidance and who will be further uh, trained during next week we expect by the public health agency on some further aspects of that. In terms of the general public, um, fear and anxiety is always a real problem and the, inf the, the trouble here is that uh, some of the queries are um, um, rather far-fetched in some respects and really all we can do is to point people to the public health guidance that's there and to the new school day guidance and make sure that people actually read it in full. Okay, I imagine that's something that we'll want to follow up with you and other members might want to come in on. Um, could, I, could I just uh, amplify and uh, add to what Adrian said there, Chair? You know, um, you know, this is complicated stuff, you know, and we, we put together the... Uh, the new school day guidance with our PHA colleagues and, and it's and it's only when you start to the schools come back and it starts to be tested in terms of all the different scenarios um, and that's why uh, we, we've worked out and, and distributed to schools um, a series of flow charts and checklists specifically focused on what schools should do in the event of a uh, suspected or unconfirmed case of COVID in their school and in the case of uh, a confirmed COVID case. And that really is, is in response to some feedback that we had from a number of schools about seeking more clarity on the precise operational aspects of what they should do. Now, we will keep that under review. And, and as I said, um, we've got really close links with our colleagues in, in health and on the PHA uh, we're in daily contact with them and we will resolve any uh, areas where there's inconsistency or, or where there's clarity needed as soon as we possibly can. Um, as I said earlier, we have link officers in place uh, around the network of schools. There are helplines in place in the EA that, that school principals can phone and um, where there are confirmed cases of COVID in schools, the PHA track and trace system will kick in and, uh, and, and proactively help and assist school principals and give them advice on what it is that they precisely need to do. Um, but it's an ongoing process, as I say, and, and, and we'll, we'll keep everything under review and refine it as we need to as we go forward. Do you want to supplement that in particular? Right. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. John, I would say to you that we need that clarity ASAP. I heard the minister, a principal, and the chief medical officer on the radio yesterday morning on different radio programmes, but there was three variations. So, um, you know, very clearly principals are telling us they don't know. As a member of this committee, as an MLA and as a parent, I also have been asked for advice. I've been getting contacted. So I would ask that that clarity and very clear as clearly as given out, and we need that ASAP. Okay, thanks, Karen. Absolutely appreciate that, and, and uh, I, I totally agree with you. Um, the other issue I wonder is, John, is in terms of extremely clinically vulnerable pupils or pupils with um, relatives who are extremely clinically vulnerable. My understanding is that the guidance. Um, says that in terms of return to school for a pupil who is extremely clinically vulnerable, I think that's pupils that, that's previously shielding. Um, 
but they are to seek advice and guidance from their GP or their consultant with regards to the appropriateness of them returning to school. Um, my understanding is for a, a, a pupil with a relative who is extremely clinically vulnerable that a, a quote-unquote risk assessment is to be conducted. Uh, this seems to be creating significant confusion and anxiety um, and challenge. Are, are, are those processes that the guidance suggests are in place to help pupils, families, principals decide with regards to return to school for those two categories working? Um, and perhaps you can give us an update as to more detail in that regard. Uh, Chair, I'm happy to, to give some guidance on that. Really, we're led by the Public Health Agency guidance on this, uh, which is that uh, uh, shielding has been paused and that all those individuals who have been shielding uh, of whatever category should uh, simply follow out the normal uh, routine guidance of hygiene and uh, catch it, kill it and bin it, etc. that the rest of the general population have been given and to be uh, just to be extra mindful of their compliance with that guidance. Uh, it's, a, it's only an extra bit of caution. Uh, the, the inclusion of a risk assessment within that was included uh, to give parents a degree of reassurance that each school would take this uh, for, for pupils would take the matter seriously and consider whether any additional risk mitigations needed to be put in place. Uh, having engaged with the Public Health Agency and uh, the Royal College of Pediatricians and the CMO, our understanding is that it, those would only be in the most exceptional cases. We're talking about perhaps one or two hundred within the province because the fundamental position from the medical side is that schools are a safe place for our children. Uh, the risk assessments we therefore view as a means for communicating with parents the mitigations that have been put in place and to reassure parents and to reassure those members of our workforce that the mitigations that we put in place have been agreed by the Department of Health and ensure that when those have been put in place and operate effectively, that schools are a safe place to both learn and work. Okay, but I'm willing to stand corrected, but my understanding is for a, an extremely clinically vulnerable pupil that the new school day guidance advises that their return to school would be in in consultation with their GP or their consultant. Is that is that not the case? Uh, yes, it is. But we expect all of those positions where they, you know, we expect parents to seek reassurance where you've had a child who's been home for some period, and that reassurance comes from talking to their GP and or their pediatrician or their oncologist or wherever else it might be. Uh, in dealing with that, the Department of Health has been very clear that it will be in the most exceptional cases where the GP. Uh, their advice to GPs and their advice to consultants is that it should be in the most exceptional cases where additional risk mitigations are required for a child. Uh, and, and the basic principle being that if, if a child is immunosuppressed or on um, receiving chemotherapy, they wouldn't be at school normally and we wouldn't expect them to be at school today. But if a child has had asthma or a, any form of a heart condition or a whole myriad of everything else, if it was safe for them to be in school last March, it's safe for them to be in school today. Okay, and, and do you know how that consultation process with GPs and consultants is going and have you any examples of when the GPs or consultants have advised against a return to school or have advised in relation to what mitigations may be needed <laughs> for that return to school? Uh, no, only, only anecdotal elements at this point where GPs are advising those pupils that they should maintain the normal position of hand hygiene, uh, etc. So uh, I'm not aware as yet of any particular uh, guidance which says any additional risk mitigation should be put in place. Um, there may be cases where in the transport position where they have advised that it's not ideal for a child to be going on a school bus for whatever reasons it may be. And I understand the EA are putting in arrangements around providing suitable home to school transport for those individuals. But again, we're talking about a small handful of the, the most absolutely clinical vulnerable children that there are 
we're not talking about the uh, vast majority of people who may have shielded in the past. And what action are you going to take to um, seek more than anecdotal feedback with regards to how that process is or isn't working for the 100 to 200 pupils in Northern Ireland that it affects? Um, I can, yeah, okay. Chair, I think I can add to that. At the moment, well, we know who those vulnerable children are. And at the moment, there's a range of multidisciplinary teams working on how to get those children back into school. Because obviously, as Adrian has pointed out, they have a, a broad range of conditions. So, for example, you will there will be children who, have, who need aerosol generating procedures. So at the moment, we are working very closely with our health colleagues and with the school teams as well to try and put in place arrangements for those children to return. So that action is on the ground and we know who the children are and we're working our way through that list. Pupils with um, extremely clinically vulnerable relatives, the guidance says that a risk assessment should be conducted. Who, who conducts that risk assessment? The risk assessment would be conducted by, by the school um, and if required, and with support by the EA officers and health colleagues as well. If, if I may just add to that, uh, Chair, um, our, our, um, our EA staff and DE staff have been working very closely with the PHA and in particular the principals of our special schools around all of this information. So that would be done on a cross-organisational, multidisciplinary approach. It wouldn't be down to one person. Okay. Um... So it's not just for the principal to make that risk assessment then? No, because these children who are clinically very vulnerable, the GP does have a role in here. So all of that would have to be taken into account. Uh, there, sorry, there, there, are, there are another category here of, of, of individuals, of pupils who, who, might, uh, who, who fell into the, to the list of shielding. For example, anybody with severe asthma or whatever who would have, who would have attended a normal mainstream school. Uh, that is for the head teacher to make an assessment uh, and our, our guidance and our uh, uh, sort of engagement with the PHA leads us to believe that a head teacher is, is quite suitable to do that because we, the head teacher will know the risk mitigations that have been put in place for their school in terms of the procedures and systems that they've in operation for hand washing, for hygiene, for cleaning, etc. And in terms of the operation of bubbles and protective segments within their school. Uh, and, you know, it, our understanding and our belief is that uh, those risk mitigations are, uh, uh, certainly from our engagement with health, those, really, those risk mitigations mean that schools are a safe place for our pupils. Whether they be whether they have been shielding in the past or not. Yeah. And what, what systems are in place to properly assess the capacity of schools to adhere to guidance and indeed implement guidance? Sorry, We're just working with our school principals and and, and our uh, school principals, EA, DE, and the public health agency are working together. And uh, what we have done is we've carried out assessments on the requirements and we're working through all of those requirements and trying to get schools operational as quickly as possible. In terms of system and processes, um, I, I think, you know, in the IDEAN system here, we would want a system of checks and balances. You could go around every school and check that they've operated it. But we, the reality of these systems and processes, they rely on human beings and we will uh, cut corners, make mistakes, etc. And we, we, you know, it's it's a managerial responsibility of our principals and of our senior leadership teams to make sure that these public health actions that are are there to ensure that our schools are remain open, that they are operating, and that they are complied with. Not just in week one, but in week twenty and in week thirty five. As well, this goes on and, and it continues to go on, you know, there is a there's a. a clearly a managerial task to make sure that this remains operational. And the EA have the responsibility to ensure adequate resources are available to the schools to be able to implement the guidance with which you're providing them, yes? Absolutely. Okay, and, and have you assessed whether they have adequate resources to implement the guidance do we know how much funding is actually going to schools at this stage? Well, Chair, you'll be, you will be aware that um, a couple of weeks ago the executive agreed an additional uh, 41 approximately million uh, for schools to cover uh, the first term 
Uh, the vast majority of that is to support schools in, um, in restarting. Uh, there's a smaller element for the provision of PPE and uh, a, a small amount for uh, to do with free school meals. Um, so at the moment, our finance colleagues are working closely with the education authority in schools to see how best to deploy uh, that money, uh, particularly the 35 million, and how that can be deployed against the range of pressures that the schools will be facing uh, over the next, uh, next few weeks. And we'll ensure that that money and those resources are available to schools uh, as soon as possible and when they need it. You've, you've sent schools back, you've given them high responsibilities in terms of risk assessments, in terms of enhanced cleaning and sanitisation, uh, perhaps additional staffing responsibilities, blended learning, and not a single penny has been received by any of those schools. Chair, Chair, perhaps I can um, add to that as well. So what schools have been advised, all the schools are required to um, allocate any costs associated with COVID. They've got a COVID-19 cost centre. So um, EA Finance, LMS colleagues have been advising schools that that's where they, I suppose, collate all of their costs associated with COVID-19. Um, and then, so it's not that they're that they're actually not, it's not that they're actually expending that money as it currently is, but they've been asked to cost it to one particular cost centre and then we can work collectively across the system with DE finance colleagues to collate that at a higher level. On that well. point, I think um, you know there, there's a, always a, a clamour for resources and the capacity to do this um, uh, to, to enable uh, actions to be undertaken. I think um, part of the, the reason uh, that we want to be careful about all of this is that uh, we don't want uh, people to uh, begin to operate protocols that are, are way in excess of what is actually needed. And there's a degree of fear and anxiety in, in our general population and in our workforce around what is needed to keep our schools safe. And fundamentally, we're being led here, and it's a bit trite to say it, we're being led by the science of what PHA tells is recommended in terms of cleaning regimes for both transport, for uh, cleaning within schools and the routine around that, cleaning around post-COVID-19 confirmed cases, etc. And, uh, you know, also the operation of how the, one of the key costs that, that, that schools will clearly uh, incur is around replacing staff, whether that be uh, support and classroom staff, um, building supervisors or teachers who are being asked to self-isolate as we go through and continue to go through the management of this pandemic. Um, you know, we, we, you can estimate this at this point, uh, and I have to confess to being an accountant in the background, uh, and I could put a number to this. It would make sense if I could justify the assumptions, uh, uh, but what it will bear out to in reality is not clear, and we need to be uh, mindful that we're trying to manage this in a way that is we're, we're, resources in, in some contexts are, are not the limiting factor here. It's about what are the appropriate clinical and scientific advice that we should be following. Okay. Very briefly, maternity leave is a specific issue. Um, it's my understanding that maternity leave under scientific health advice is now being advised to um, commence from 28 weeks. Um, is, does the Department of Education meet the additional costs in relation to that for maternity leave um, pay, and how will they be assisting schools to also then meet the additional costs from additional um, substitute teacher cover? There is funding has been secured uh, for schools for substitute cover. Um, I, in relation to maternity, particularly to maternity leave, I'm not a HR expert, so I can't uh, to speak about the detail, but I do know that the, the funding has been secured for sub for subteachers for schools and supporting schools, yeah, for COVID. Well, well the, the, the Department of Education, it's my understanding, meets the cost of paying a teacher during maternity leave. That may be, there may be an additional cost to that, if that is for a longer period of time. Will they continue to meet those costs? 
Chair, the, the principle hasn't changed. Um, yeah. The department will still meet the cost of uh, the of teachers during maternity leave. That that's a principle that has been followed. Uh, uh, the definition of maternity leave, it's, if it's been changed on, on, to comply with the guidance, means that the department and the EA will have to manage that cost. It's just one part of the, the many costs that are being incurred throughout this pandemic. Finally, finally, the, the funding is designed to meet the first term. When when will the schools receive that, that funding? As soon as the mechanism is in place to provide it, yeah. As soon as, as soon as possible, Chair. Um, you know, schools are only just back. Um, they, they won't be incurring uh, major costs at this stage. They have their annual schools delegated budget already confirmed to them some time ago. Um, and as Adrian and, and colleagues have said, you know, we have money available, uh, £41 million for the first term. Um, we've never been through this kind of uh, situation before we've got to work out how to deploy that money where the, where the, the pressure points are uh, and that's what we're endeavoring to do as quickly as possible so that schools do have the resources available uh, when what, they need it what will the mechanism be for allocating the funding john is it the common funding scheme uh chair i don't know the detail of that uh, we'd need to come back to you on it okay can I bring in Deputy Chairperson Karen Mullen, MLA? Thank you, Chair. <coughs> Thank you, everybody, for attending. I suppose I, I just want to pick up on a, a few things from the Chair, but they're just for Adrian and John. Finished off as well in relation to working our way through this. But yet and all, we know from June, the Minister and the Department have been working on the approach of full return for September. And I find what the answers we've got so far today, but also what we heard from the unions earlier and what we heard from the unions two weeks ago, that we're sitting in the first week of, of September getting most children back and we still don't have clear answers, never mind clear guidance. Uh, you know, on the side of the 12th to the 14th of August, I don't have the exact date, the finance minister agreed the budget, but yet and all, we still don't know the mechanism of how it's going to go out. Um, and uh, how much schools are going to get. Uh, and John, I tell you, a post-primary school in my area has spent thousands getting the school ready to have pupils back from uh, August, uh, pupils and staff. Uh, she has done this on the basis that the money is going to be coming forward. It yet does not know what that will look like. Um, so I suppose this morning, as I say, it was very disappointing to hear that there were still so many outstanding issues and concerns and the lack of involvement or litness for the unions. Um, uh, and we've raised this with the Minister. And a number of weeks ago, I think it was two weeks ago, the Minister was here and I just want to pick up on the risk assessments and again, conflicting information. Um, the Minister, I had asked him, and I have wrote to him, and I'm still waiting for a response, but I'll be going back today on it, around those children who are medically vulnerable and need a risk assessment. And the Chair has quite rightly went through a lot of the detail, but what I would say is, Adrian, you had said there, we knew who these children were in March, so um, can I get an answer today that all of those children, and it's a small amount of children, as you have alluded to in the Minister, the Minister made it clear to us that it was a medical professional who was going to carry out that assessment. I have been advising parents, um, and probably giving them the wrong advice at this stage now, uh, but on the advice that I got from the Minister, I was advising them. So if it's a small amount of children, has the risk assessment been carried out for every single one of them? And uh, the resources and support and provision in place that they will all be back at school this week and they won't be left at home and left behind because it's not in place. Well, Karen, just in terms of the the, um, the letter that you wrote to, to the Minister, I will chase that one up today and, and we'll get that back to you as soon as possible. I, I think I would just say in terms of the guidance, you know, we, we've been in... On this endeavour, since uh, before June, with uh, the practitioners group of 20 principals that represent all the different phases and, and different school types, uh, we, we've consulted with trained unions throughout that time and, and managing authorities. Um, the, the guidance was put together 
in agreement with the PHA and you know it's a framework it's trying to, to strike a balance that not no two schools are the same uh, school principals need a degree of autonomy to, to implement the guidance which are uh, you know respective to their own particular circumstances and when we issued the revised guidance on the 13th of August um, the, the changes were relatively small um, it was mainly to do with uh, all schools coming back full time uh, from from the 24th of August um, of course we are going to get uh, issues that arise now that schools are back um, you know no guidance can be absolutely prescriptive to cover every single uh, set of eventualities um, and that's why we're still working with the PHA and we will continue to engage with school leaders and the practitioners group and trade unions to, to resolve them as, as quickly as we can because we acknowledge that schools are in a very difficult position and, uh, and, and they do seek clarity and, and you know we'll, we'll, we're working on that uh, as, as we go forward. I asked again, it's a small amount of children who are known to the Education Authority. Has their assessment been carried out by the, the relevant medical professional and the provision been put in place for them to attend school without delay? <clears throat> if safe to do so. Sorry, as in, uh, as in from the 20th of August, the week of the 20th of August, revised guidance came in terms of aerosol generated procedures. And so what we have done is the Education Authority, the Department of Education have worked closely with the PHA and drawn in the five health trusts to make sure that the most adequate guidance and support is there. And what we are doing is supporting those school principals to make sure all of those procedures are in place and we're trying to get those children into school as quickly as possible. Following that guideline, those guidelines, it may be this week, it may be next week, but we are putting all resources that we have behind supporting that revised guidance. Great, Michelle, thank you. Um, uh, in relation to, um, we've obviously, uh, the chair had went through the tests in there. Some teachers have expressed concerns about, um, and parents, are, uh, you know, about the distinguishing the, the symptoms, between the symptoms between COVID, cold and flu. And we're going under the, this period now. Can the department advise if the minister is working with the uh, executive to bring forward a mass vaccination program to include teachers and parents for the winter flu in 2020? Do we know? A mass vaccination program for flu. For flu. Yeah, as my, certainly my understanding is that health are working on a vaccination program. That that's a national program uh, throughout the the UK, uh, and Northern Ireland will follow part of that. I, I'm afraid I don't have the detail on what is being proposed. Uh, I suspect health officials are still working on that, uh, uh, but that certainly will uh, be extending the existing definition and the categories of people who would be eligible for uh, flu vaccination. Uh, so yes, we would expect that to be to be ruled out, um, and we will. Uh, it's a normal public health duty. Uh, schools will facilitate that in terms of providing the lists of pupils and access for the public health agency uh, nurses and doctors to carry out that vaccination in line with normal um, public health vaccination programs. Yep. Thanks, Adrian. And um, just back, you were you were highlighting you know the different symptoms earlier. So what I'm asking for um, is an information flyer or something to be produced by the Education Authority for schools and parents showing the different symptoms for the three uh, different areas, distinguishing between them, but also advising what action. And that follows on from the Chair's questioning around the testing, but I think it would be very, very useful because we're going to go on, as we know, we don't need to go over it. We don't have time today in relation to you know what to do. So uh, I would ask that the Education Authority would do that. That's a, that's a, a, a take point, Karen. Uh, we're working on that at the moment um, because obviously what we want to avoid is parents and, and schools being confused about when to distinguish between real COVID symptoms and ordinary coughs and sniffles, um, you know, and give people clear guidance on, on the distinction between the two. And crucially, 
what they should do or not do, uh, depending on, on what the symptoms are. Obviously, what we don't want is, uh, as we've seen in Scotland over the last number of weeks, where they experienced a 300% rise in the number of young people seeking uh, COVID-19 tests, uh, when potentially uh, the, 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 all they got was a common cold. Uh, obviously, that's got implications for PHA resources, uh, etc. So, but uh, take your point, you know, this is one of the things where we just need to put out some supplementary clear guidance, uh, and that's what we're working on today. John, um, I want to bring you on to transport, and you may have heard uh, the briefing that we got beforehand. I wanted to take you to page 42 of your new school day guidance. Um, where on section D it talks about vehicle cleaning. Um, I'm just going to read it out here because I know I'm prompting this, pushing this, and he's mightn't have it in front of you. The EA will work with transport operators to agree arrangements for cleaning vehicles. Operators should maintain high hygiene standards for buses delivering home to school transport. This should include rigorous cleaning standards, including frequent cleaning of high frequency touch points, should be undertaken should be undertaken or all our mitigating options put in place to limit the spread of COVID-19. Now, we don't see, and, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, I've been just looking over this sitting here, the guidance in relation to cleaning um, uh, and safety on the Education Authority fleet. And it was very, very concerning to hear this morning from a bus driver and a member of the union uh, that, that that is not the standard that has been carried out within the Education Authority fleet, yet we're being asked, we're asking it of the private operators. We're, we've heard of bus drivers having to take buses back to schools that don't have, some don't have hot water, um, and uh, cleaning them themselves. The rigorous cleaning not being carried out throughout the day, and again, the cab screens not being in place. Again, I'll go back to we knew in June we were coming back to full reopening. We knew the fleet was sitting there. We knew it needed to be ready, not ready, and PPE not being in place. Um, this is very, very concerning, and it, it also was very concerning in relation to the cleaning of schools. So just quickly on that point, because I know all our members will want to come in, is uh, does, if, if Dale can answer the, some of the queries on the school transport cleaning, and also on as the Education Authority going to have an oversight over schools in relation to what cleaning has been carried out, or has it very much been left up to the principals um, and school leaders? And I have to say, just on the final point, and I will finish here, I find it just so uh, frustrating that a lot of these pressures have been put directly on principals, that we've heard here today that they're responsible for all the risk assessments of the school estate, the risk assessments of staff, and the risk assessments of children with a vulnerability. Is, is just shocking on top of everything else. Um, but that's the last point. Just, Dale, if you could pick up on both of those in terms of cleaning. Okay, uh, Karen, I'll try and pick up on as much as that as possible. And if you need to come back to me, if I forget something, that's fine. Look, I suppose, first of all, I was disappointed to hear the comments comments from Thomas. Um, but what I would want to do is reassure you that we do have suitable cleaning arrangements in place. And the cleaning arrangements that we have in place have been agreed directly with the public health agency. Um, our arrangements are that the vehicle is cleaned at the end of the day, which is the normal arrangement. And with the EA fleet, the drivers, as part of their contractual duties, it's their job to clean their vehicle and they have all the equipment to do that. Um, they have also been required within their own transport guidance to clean the, 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 the touch points on at least a twice daily basis when possible. Um, we have hand sanitizers fitted to the vehicles. All the drivers have been provided with masks, face shields, gloves, aprons, and cleaning materials. And, and yes, um, over the period of last week, some of that has been, the, the pace of getting that out to different drivers in different areas has been variable, but we've worked hard and our, our services were open over the weekend to make sure the drivers could get that. So in terms of the cleaning, the, the arrangements there are in place. And it's back to the, the hand hygiene bit about, about washing. Obviously, children are getting on the bus and they're being encouraged to use the hand sanitizer when they get on. They're being encouraged to use the hand sanitizer when they get off. 
and then when they get off the bus and they're going to school, they're being, they're, they're being encouraged to wash their hands there. So all of that is in place to break the cycle of the infection. And the drivers themselves, obviously, they're being encouraged to use the hand sanitizer and have access to it and have access to the small pumps as well. Um, you mentioned a bit there about hot water at some schools. Look, were, were those small individual cases are brought to our attention, then we are dealing with that. Um, I've probably forgotten something else that you've asked, Karen. if you want to, if I haven't covered anything there. Karen, can, can I just come in on this point, if you don't mind? Uh, just to, uh, Cleaning is an issue um, because we, uh, both staff and parents, and, or staff, parents and pupils, all feel that, uh, that that is one of the key measures to mitigate the risk uh, of continued transmission. And that, and to a certain extent, it is. However, the key measure with making the school safe is on the use of hand sanitizers and hand washing. Fundamentally, if children, and, and I'm sorry, uh, not excluding, but in, ensuring that uh, children who have any symptoms don't get onto the school transport or public transport or get into school. And head teachers have been very clear that they will send children home who are obviously exhibiting those symptoms and a bus driver is also free to say don't be getting on my bus. So the first thing is you don't allow individuals who have any symptoms into the school environment and that's from the bus through to the playground through to the classroom. When you do, when the ch child goes into that the key mitigation factor is first of all that they're encouraged to use the hand sanitizer which is about 70 odd percent successful in terms of um, maintaining and um, cleaning off the virus and then encouraged to go straight away to wash your hands before they go on into the school. In doing so that breaks the cycle and therefore the risk within the school environment is like creating a ring of steel around it. If every parent, teacher and pupil does that, the risk within the school is extremely minimal unless an individual is asymptomatic and has board, uh, boarded a bus or got into school. And then there are mitigations that are put in place to reduce the transmission within school. And that's there around the segmentation of people into bubbles and then reducing the amount of interactions. So you have to see it as an entire system. One individual measure is not, the, is not going to be the answer to everything. And the public health advice, it's very simple. Normal cleaning protocols apply. Nothing special, no steam, no fancy chemicals. Normal cleaning protocols, the individuals who are doing it can wear routine PPE that we would have expected them to wear in the first place, uh, rubber gloves, an apron, a mask. And, and when you're doing that in a normal school environment, you are at very negligible levels of risk. And that's why we're keen to make sure that the point is that routine cleaning should happen and should have happened anyway. This is not adding anything else because the key point is making sure that the entrance to the school and that ring of steel is protected where you don't allow individuals in and that you make sure there's thorough hand washing at the beginning of the school day. Um, uh, you know, the basics need to be there first. Um, you know, like this, this, the protective screens for the bus drivers and all that, but you know, in, the in your own guidance, you're asking public operators, private operators for high hygiene standards and rigorous cleaning. So that's conflicting in itself if you're saying normal cleaning is, is okay for the education authority fleet. But I don't want to get caught up on it here. I think, you know, an O'Dale and an O'Hale go away and they'll ensure that um, whatever needs to be done will be done. And just we need to hear from the education authority in terms of the oversight that is going to be provided to schools in relation to cleaning and what... I know you're saying okay, that they should come forward to you and let you know what they need, um, but we just need to ensure the standards are, are there and the resources are there. John, can I go back? First, first in terms of the, the screens and the buses, because you knew you'd asked that and you've just reminded me. I mean, we, we had done our risk assessments. We'd spoken to the public health agency and they had advised that for the education authority fleet, we didn't require um, screens. However, treating colleagues in, in consultation with them, and we did consult with them, and we, and we did share the risk assessment with them. During that process, they indicated that their members were concerned and that they would like this, the screens fitted and felt that it would provide further protection. And on that basis, we did take the decision to fit the screens. So 
th those screens are being fitted over and above what our risk assessments are actually requiring us to do. So I just want to provide reassurance around that and I wanted to provide reassurance that actually risk assessments were shared with trade unions and we did consult with them on that matter. In, in terms of the cleaning service, look, just to be clear, the Education Authority, we, we, we're responsible for the cleaning of about 390 to 400 schools across the province and obviously the rest of the, the, the schools are responsible for their own cleaning. I mean, we're, we're working closely with the schools that we clean, but we're also there and as part of the dedicated principals helpline, there is, a, there is an option there to speak to our cleaning service. So if any school have any concerns about cleaning, they can contact us. And we're also available to go into schools and provide the enhanced cleans where there's been a, a confirmed uh, case of COVID-19. So look, we're there to support the schools as much as practically possible. And we do have um, the protocols and arrangements in place to do that. Okay, thanks, Car. I'm going to bring in William Humphrey, MLA. Good, good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for your attendance here. Can I just, at the outset, thank the Minister, Department and EA officials for all their hard work and commitment uh, and during COVID, which has provided very difficult uh, and unique circumstances, uh, obviously, which no one has had to operate in before. I would pay tribute to, to everyone involved, both in the Department and in terms of the EA, and also thank those involved in the summer schemes which i know were, were very beneficial for our young people uh, again particularly uh, acute in terms of the, the their absence from the classroom since march so thank you all very much um i don't know whether you all had the opportunity to listen to the uh, evidence that was um, given to the committee by the various trade union representatives some of it was concerning so i think it's your opportunity now to provide some clarification both for this committee, uh, for the general public, and in particular for the principals and staff and pupils at schools. Um, if I might start with the, the, the um, part of the evidence that Mr. Alan Long gave from NIPSA when he was talking about the four chief medical officers letters, um, uh, where he basically said that he doesn't believe that the uh, arrangements are uh, in place or exist uh, in terms of the school estate in Northern Ireland as set out by those letters, including obviously our own Chief Medical Officer, Mr McBride. Could someone respond to that, please? Yeah, I, I, I can confirm that the guidance was drawn up uh, by DE officials and shared with PHA and with the CMO and the medical team within the Department of Health. And they confirmed that the range of mitigations that we propose, which are broadly similar to what's in operation uh, within the rest of the UK and in the Republic of Ireland, that that system uh, is, is the basis of his letter and the four CMO's letter to say that schools are a safe environment. Right, so, so you, you would contest that um, the arrangements are in place? Well, the, the guidance has been provided and the schools are operating it. Um, we can never be 100% sure that every school is operating to 100% level of effectiveness, uh, but to that extent, the guidance that we provided uh, and to which the Chief Medical Officer has made his assessment is based on compliance with that, and compliance with that would ensure an environment that is safe for both our parents, pupils, and our education workforce. I, I think, as I said earlier, I, the, the communication and the dissemination of information is crucial in the current climate in which everyone's having to operate uh, to fend off this horrible disease. Um, can, I, can I just say in terms of um, the, the issue raised uh, about the Public Health Authority, and that's not the direct remit of this committee, but I did uh, earlier propose that the committee write to uh, the PHA suggesting that trade union official should be asked to sit uh, on that group. Uh, it seems to me self-evident that there should be a voice if, if the practitioners are having to carry these things out uh, that um, it's important that the voice of the people who are actually going to have to do that work on the ground on the cold face as it were is actually being being heard so further to that then um, deal I suppose I may turn to you um, in terms of the evidence given by Mr McMichael around transport I listened to your previous answers where you talked about you had consulted. I mean, very clearly, Mr. McMichael was saying that that um, drivers and trade union officials, I suppose he was referring to, 
had attended meetings, um, but not con true consultations, was how he put it. Can you reassure this committee again that, that the views of drivers and trade union officials around the transportation are actually being listened to? And I did listen really intently and closely to your last answer, but if you could reassure us, please, that would be helpful because he said that the EA plans were, I quote, ill thought out and no input had been sought from those who do the job. Was it another direct quotation? Okay, sorry, you just broke up at the last couple of seconds there, but look, happy to provide that reassurance and just to reiterate, um, whenever we conducted our original risk, risk, risk assessment, which helped draw up the guidance, the, the risk assessment was shared with the, the trade union mechanism that is formally in place. Um, trade unions did feedback and, and part of their concern was, as I've said previously, around the screens and we responded to and, and reacted to that. Um, we have had ongoing engagement with the trade unions. We had two meetings with the trade unions last week about transport um, and we agreed a series of further mitigations and actions as part of that. And, and look, we appreciate that, that our staff are anxious about various aspects. And I can also confirm today that we, we are scheduled to have a meeting tomorrow with the trade unions on, on transport issues. And we're hopeful that at that meeting, we will have addressed and actioned out many of the things that we agreed to do. So look, I, I hope that that is a sufficient reassurance around that matter. I mean, I think that's important to hear and I thank you for that clarification, but it does provide some concern to me, to be honest, as a governor in two schools, when we hear trade unions saying, and then you know, representing one of your employees, a driver of one of your buses, that they're not being listened to, it's ill thought out, and uh, there's no input being sought. Uh, and you can understand our position as members and constituency members um, and school governors for many of us. That this information we were provided, you know, uh, information in the previous um, set of of, of um, interviewees who are, who are giving us information, which um, obviously is at variance what we just heard from yourselves. I mean, that, that, that I think communication and clarification is needed around all these things. We need everybody to be on the same page so that the message going out isn't confused because within the space of, you know, a couple of hours, we've heard vastly different uh, evidence, both from the trade unions and, and now yourselves. Um, one of the things I did, did, did um, suggest earlier as well was, you know, I understand you have a fleet deal uh, and um, your, your, your fleet is of a certain size. And I think, to be honest, um, most of the education authority buses will be used in rural context and not many of them will be used in, um, in terms of uh, the major schools in Belfast used uh, for transportation of children to school. Um, it will be TransLink or private operators. Is there more can be done between yourselves and TransLink, given that they will have, and the, the current environment in which you're having to operate, they will have much more resource in terms of the cleaning of buses, you know, and all of that and experience and whatever. Uh, is there some uh, synergy? Have you been talking to them? Are there plans to talk to them in terms of how you can perhaps uh, share your experiences and, and provide um, you know, the, a, a standard that is right across the fleet, theirs and yours? Uh, uh, absolutely, William. I mean, first of all, just, just to reassure you, we have been meeting with TransLink on a weekly basis um, about getting the school transport network up and running for the start of the new school year. Um, TransLink have worked really hard with us on that, so we already have a really strong and close re relationship around that. We, we do operate two very different fleets. Um, and in terms of our cleansing regimes, we, we have gone about that in a slightly different way. Um, the, the, their vehicles operate much more on a, I'm not going to say 24-7 basis, but they're certainly a much more intense basis than the Education Authority fleet does. So um, we have approached that in slightly different ways. But yes, the teams are working together. And where there's opportunities to avail of resource either way, then we will certainly avail of that if we can. Okay, and finally, can I just ask, in terms of the Public Health Authority and the, the, the Chief Medical Officer's Office, uh, how often are those, you mentioned was made earlier of the um, regular meetings that are being held, which I'm pleased to hear, because obviously it's very important that uh, the, the, this department in particular, in terms of reopening schools and the safe reopening of schools, 
listens to the advice of the professionals, i.e. the chief medical officer, the public health authority and so on, how often are you meeting um, uh, and can you provide some reassurance around that to, to the um, school estate in terms of its employees right across teaching and non-teaching staff and parents who are sending their children to school this week, some of them for the very first time? Yeah, I, I can deal with that. So, William, in, in terms of the uh, the CMO office and the and the and the PHA <clears throat> agency, we we've been working with those two organisations at senior level and through the organisation for months now. You know, I and mean, going back to uh, the point Adrian made earlier on, the the first and the second iterations of the new school day guidance were not produced in isolation in Rathgale House. They were done informed by the scientific evidence produced by SAGE, which is the UK government's overarching uh, advisory body in that regard. We uh, worked with um, an informed by guidance that the Department for Education had put out for England, and we quality reviewed and assessed that with the uh, Chief Medical Officer and his teams and in the PHA. So that's just to reassure committee members as to the, the, uh, the provenance of our guidance, if you like. <coughs> We're acutely aware that when schools come back, as they did last week and this week, um, there will be issues arise and circumstances that, that couldn't have been foreseen in the guidance because the guidance is a, you know, it's a high level framework it goes down to a certain level of detail and in order to make sure that we can respond rapidly to operational matters um, we're now meeting with the CMO and the deputy CMOs and senior officials in PHA twice a week uh, and that involves myself uh, and other senior colleagues in DE and in the education authority and that happens twice a week, just to keep a, a strategic view on, on how things are going, particularly in these early weeks. Underneath all that, there are a group of colleagues within the department and within the EA working uh, at a more operational level with uh, the PHA and the track and trace uh, teams to um, resolve any technical or operational points that need to be resolved. And we're putting significant resource into that for the next few weeks because we recognise that this is such a, 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 a critical time for schools and parents. And I just wanted to just give well, that over that's, that's, Yeah, no, I really appreciate that. Thank you very much. Look, I would just make the point, I'm, I'm pleased that those meetings are happening and that information being shared, but the communication and the dissemination of that to schools, to parents, to governors, uh, that is, and, and, and to the media, is absolutely hugely important so that everyone is absolutely clear and that the department, the EA, uh, the schools, and uh, uh, the, the uh, entire community is reassured and that everyone's on the same, same page in terms of that information. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. Daniel? Is he on mute? Daniel, are you on mute? Broadcasting. Can I check that Assembly have added, Broadcasting have added Daniel to the spotlight? Okay, I'll bring Robbie Butler in and we'll come back to Daniel immediately thereafter um, once we've got him linked in. Robbie. Okay, thank you, Chair. Uh, thanks, guys, for, for joining us today again. Um, I just want to pick up on something that, that um, William Humphreys had, had talked about there. I think it's really important. And um, when, we, when we look at the, the, the purpose of, of school and the added import at the moment with, uh, with COVID um, and pupils needing to be at the centre of the conversation and the confidence that needs to be built for our um, pupils with their parents and their teachers and so on, that that consultation piece needs to be bottomed out. And, and this is... Um, Listen, I'll go back to my days when I was a, a union official back in the fire service, and sometimes the difference between a consultation and a meeting uh, was very grey. 
uh, and sometimes um, the employer used a meeting as a form of consultation when it wasn't, or sometimes as a union official we, 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 we uh, fudged the issue of what that was. And, and here's the responsibility, not just for the departments, this isn't for you guys, this is for the rep bodies too, but there needs to be a real grown up conversation with regards to that consultation and nail down that when those conversations happen they are marked as a consultation and not just as a meeting because that's not that really is not acceptable in terms of building confidence because we've got pupils we've got parents we've got teachers um who are genuinely concerned and anxious so we're all facing the same direction and this is starting to really frustrate and anger me that each of these meetings we have it's the, it's the same tone, it's the same manner. And I understand that um, you know, information is coming out as quite new and quite fast and frantic, but we're all facing the same direction. So I, I'm, I'm really quite mystified as to why we can't t tie down what a consultation actually is and have those defined periods, even if they're short periods. Um, and I think they need to be bracketed. So I would suggest whether it's the, the rep bodies um, or the, 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 the other agencies that you've got involved, I think that's what we need to do. Guys, I was reading in, in the guidance that was provided um, a piece on wellbeing guidance, the dissemination of well, uh, wellbeing guidance, which I think started about, um, yeah, so you launched a, a wellbeing guidance section for schools on the 17th of August, um, which is absolutely brilliant and we've been pushing that obviously but there's a wee bit in there which i just need maybe some clarity on and it's uh it's, it's even referenced in here so it talks about the nurturing approach but it's, it's uh, come to my attention that the ea nurture team has been disbanded um i, I don't know if that's absolutely true or not um but i mean if, if we're moving in from a, a period of of uncertainty and, and, and COVID issues which are compounding the existing sort of mental health and emotional well-being uh, problem that we have. Could I get some confirmation that that's not the case, that the uh, nurture team haven't been disbanded? And could you give me a sit rep on that at the moment, please? Certainly, yes, Chair. I'm happy to, to take that. Certainly, as you referenced, the, um, the COVID crisis threw us all in to help and support everybody as best we can. Uh, but at no time was the nurture team disbanded and as the restart program started in April time and the well-being strategy was being devised that nurture team were central to that strand of work and they have been providing the guidance and providing a huge input into all of the documents that are available because it is that nurture a uh, that that nurture element that is crucial in these opening days of school so there, there may be some truth in that perhaps for some weeks they were diverted to other areas, but they certainly have never been disbanded. And since the wellbeing strategy has, has become such a focus, they are there and central to all of that guidance that's being produced. Um, having a, a nurture centre uh, or a hub put in place but hadn't achieved that yet, perhaps is it maybe just a delay then um, that it may be the case and that, that, that if, if that was a promissory note that that would still be forthcoming hopefully, yes? I would, I would, I would assume so. Um, business as usual, as you know, has been paused so perhaps that work uh, has been paused and I, and I can't say that with certainty, it's not my department. However, what I can say is that the, the value and the importance of the nurture units moving forward will certainly make them a big priority. <coughs> Discussions, um, I think, with, the, with the, the teaching representative bodies, and, and there was an announcement made with regard to helplines uh, for principals and teachers. Um, could we get an update today um, with regard to uh, are, are those helplines live? Um, and also, uh, given the fact that our, our, our teachers and heads work nine to five. Um, is there the capacity that these will be available uh, after hours or out of hours? Robbie, I can take that. Um, yes, we had an emergency operation helpline centre operating and we had it operating at the start of COVID, but that helpline has continued throughout. And about three weeks ago, we stood that up to operate. So it is operating on a nine to five basis, but it does have access to out of hours um, support if required from senior education authority officers. So um, that, that's monitored out of hours plus at the weekend. So I can confirm that is in place. Could you just um, outline where, where that information would be get for the, for the out of hours contact for um, if you could deal so that for anybody that, that isn't aware of that might be able to access okay, so, it. Yeah. So, 
Okay, sorry, sorry. So the principals have been um, circulated the telephone number of the helpline. Whenever they phone through the helpline, they have a number of options. So if it's open from nine to five, of six or seven various options that that they can that they can avail of. Um, once that operates outside of five o'clock, there's a standard message asking them to send an email to uh, a mailbox, and that's monitored on a regular basis. And then a senior officer will get back to them. Not then, because um, I think it, listen, it's brilliant. The helpline will be a, a lifeline to to many of those principals. Um, I'm pretty sure that between nine to five, Monday to Friday, most of our principals literally have got a lot of uh, firefighting to do. To use that analogy, especially at the moment, um, they've got the complexity of running their schools, but also also got the the, the, the region inferno of COVID, the risk assessments, and the, the continual. Um, sort of hyper vigilance of all that's going on in schools with children coming in, children coming out, one way systems, and all of those things. Is there any capacity or any likelihood that, that the, the hours might be changed in that? To something that might um, be more flexible to suit? I mean, does it have to be nine to five? Could it be for the people that are providing help now to be fair to them that they're available at a different time? It, it doesn't have to be nine to five. It can absolutely be something else if we believe that that's what was required. But given um, over the last two weeks, we have found that that has worked well. So from an EA helpline perspective, we don't believe that at this stage, the evidence suggests that we need to extend it to, you know, uh, later on in the evening or at the weekends. However, should circumstances, you know, contrive that we feel we need to move that to different operating times, we have a, an alternative model that we can put in place basically at the, at the head of a switch. So look, that, that's there, but at this stage, I would reassure you that we don't feel we need to extend the opening hours and that the arrangements we have in place are sufficient to support the schools. Visit with you um, at another time if, if, if things sort of change. Obviously, it's, a, it's an evolving situation. Um, could you outline for us then how schools access the COVID, COVID centre funding for clean, extra cleaning, extra hygiene, and the staffing resources? Is that is that the simple process of uh, of bidding for the money from the COVID centre? Is it, is it, has it been done yet? Are, are, are teachers involved in bidding for that extra money at the moment? Um, and how simple I mean, is the system? I mean, in, in broad term, terms, Robbie, what we did as working with the operational teams, working with EA finance colleagues and working with DE finance colleagues, was to build up a, a pressure bit of what we thought that might look like. So we had to estimate what, what the additional cleaning materials would be required, what the additional hours would be required, what the additional PPE would be required, and, and we pulled that all together. Um, and I think as colleagues have, have, have alluded, so we have at a very high level a global figure of what that looks like across the system. In terms then of the dissemination of those funds across um, each of the school settings and the school categories, because obviously it's different, um, that, that still has to be worked out between DE colleagues and EA finance colleagues. Um, and I think that, I think it's probably the chair that asked this earlier on. I think the answer was as soon as possible. Then it's probably um, the, the same question. Um, can you give me an idea of what as soon as possible may be? Because obviously schools are operating. The, 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 some of them are operating in serious deficits already. You know, the, 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 from previous years. So obviously that confidence um, that they're not going into further deficit and having to try and pay that back in. That it is a separate system that they'll be able to avail of that that money. It doesn't complicate their own financial structures. Well, obviously, it, it, it will depend on the category of school. Obviously, if they're controlled schools, then the same uh, cash flow issues aren't the same within that sector. But I think, from what I understand, I think colleagues are working to get that done as soon as possible. So I, I would guess, and I don't want to guess or speculate, but I would assume we're certainly in this, the period of short period of weeks to get that done. And this is a final question, um, and then I'll let the chair move on to the next one, guys. Um, so uh, I understand where the where the guidance and the plan is, is, is um, and you've rightly said that uh, you've been in consultation with the CMO, the CSO uh, and all of those experts. I have a real interest in the risk assessment um, part of it um, and in terms of the, I know you guys have all answered s some way in re regards to the indemnity, but can you tell me the generic risk assessments, who designed them, where they come from and genuinely do you think that they're fit for the purpose of COVID? Um, because I, I had a little look at them, and whilst I can't see any sort of uh, glaring emission from them, I'm, I'm, I just want to get some confidence that they're they're useful for the purpose that they've, that they've been put in. They do look very generic, to be fair, and that might be fine. But was there any um, 
was there any expert guidance sought with regard to the, the, the effectiveness of the risk assessment model used? Because I just have a genuine uh, a fear with regard to the complexity of the principles having to carry them out and the need for the robustness of the, the, the risk assessment methodology to be as, as absolute as it can be. <clears throat> Okay, look, I'll try and pick that up for you as well. So in terms of the risk assessments, those were devised um, primarily using health, health and safety support from the Education Authority. Um, it was done through the practitioners group, so there was um, feedback and consultation with them. And as, as referenced earlier, there's about 20 principals across a range of schools involved in that. And then there was also uh, supported by our school development service internally between within the Education Authority. So. There, there, there was a significant period of time spent developing those risk assessments um, across the various categories of schools and sectors to make sure that they were as fit as per, fit for purpose as possible. Um, in addition to that, Robbie, just to give you an additional bit of reassurance, one, one of the dedicated helplines that principals can access is in relation to risk assessments, and the Education Authority's health and safety team are there to support principals to reassure them and to help them either A, in the completion of risk assessments or to provide reassurance on one that they've already completed. This doesn't really require an answer. I'm just going to ask that on the risk assessment piece that you, you, you guys monitor that, review it and improve it on an ongoing basis. And you probably are, and forgive me, I'm not being cheeky, just, I just believe in the, in the dispensation we're in, the need to be constantly reviewing the appropriateness, the effectiveness of what we're doing is as important as anything because I accept uh, that you guys, uh, as we are, we're working in uncharted uh, waters um, and we, we, we need to be as agile as we can be to make sure that, that, that everything is as up to date um, and as uh, uh, professionally accredited as it, as it can be. So, so thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thanks, Robbie. Daniel McCrossan, MLA. Yes, Chair, can you hear me now? Yeah. Yep, go ahead. Yeah, uh, thank you to um, the directors of EA and to John from the Department of Education for their presentation. I think at the outset it's important to acknowledge the huge and the immense work by teaching and non-teaching staff throughout our schools and the pressure that has been placed on them throughout what has been a very challenging uh, time and no doubt the, as well the huge amount of work that has been carried out across the Department of Education and uh, throughout EA as well uh, in preparation. That said, however, there are huge issues and that remains very clear even uh, throughout this morning's presentation that there are considerable uncertainties about the process uh, to ensure that schools are uh, uh, protected uh, and that schools are properly resourced and financed uh, where necessary. It worries me in some of the contributions, particularly around funding, uh, to hear uh, a number of, of things like um, uh, uh, it may be, uh, I think it could be, as soon as possible. All those terms tell me one simple thing and again reaffirm the concern of teachers and principals out there that there is just no certainty when it comes to funding. And there was a comment made by Adrian uh, uh, in his presentation uh, or comments at the, at the start uh, uh, around um, how this funding will be allocated. It will be allocated based on need almost, I think, not to uh, in any way misquote them. But what happens in a situation where there is an outbreak in school and a school has reached out for the necessary funding or resources or PPE or whatever it may be, or even cleaning or, or, or anything like that? Um, what happens in that situation when the school hasn't had the necessary funding? And the other thing as well, we have to remember, schools are now back. Uh, and they have had to put things in place within very large schools and indeed small schools uh, without any extra resources or any extra funding whatsoever. So I'm very, very concerned that even today, as we sit here, after six months of schools being closed, there is considerable unanswered questions to some of the most fundamental and simplest uh, questions that have been posed by not only teachers and staff and, and principals, but also by unions and parents and politicians as well. So. I, I need some certainty, particularly from John, around the, there was a, a, a comment made about the mechanism. When is this going to be in place and when are schools actually going to see money? I'd want to hear a, a situation where uh, uh, we'll, they'll get it when and if they need it, we'll ensure that. They should have the extra resources there. Principals are expected to step up to the plate uh, 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 and always have and always uh, 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 will. But I think that uh, certainly in this instance with this pandemic, 
our teaching workforce, our principals and our non-teaching staff have been taken for granted by the Department of Education and the Education Authority on this basis. If we trust them with everything else, let's trust them with the budget for the school to ensure that they have staff and pupils. So can you come in on that, John, please, first, and then Adrian? Okay, thank, thanks, Daniel. Look, in terms of facts, facts are uh, the executive agreed an extra 41, 42 million for education a couple of weeks ago. Uh, you know, and, and that, that is absolutely certain. In terms of the precise mechanism for getting that money out to schools or whether it's held and schools, you know, there might be certain items that are paid for by the EA and schools simply order them down so there's no actual cost to the schools. I wouldn't like to speculate on that. What I can say is we want to make sure that there are no impediments to schools in getting what they need to get up and running properly in this and um, I will make sure I'll go back to our finance colleagues and we'll get back to you with some clarity as soon as possible. I don't know the precise mechanisms for, for this. The accountants are working it through, but we'll come back to you quickly with some clarity on that. And that, that, that's all I can say really on that. In terms of provision of PPE, cleaning materials, hand sanitizer, etc., cetera, and, and, and Dale will know more about this than me, but there are stocks in place, there are helplines in place, schools know exactly what they need to do in order to get the, the, those uh, materials delivered to their schools and how they need to be ordered. Um, and th there shouldn't be any situation where uh, today a school doesn't have what it needs in terms of uh, cleaning hand sanitizer and any any items of PPE. Would that be yeah, right? I mean, that, that's absolutely right. John, Daniel, just to reassure you, yeah, <clears throat> so the three bits to that, A, the bit about sourcing the supplies, the schools. Um, I, I have written to schools now four times in, in the past four to five weeks, reminding schools how they can order supplies. Um, we have worked hard, our teams have worked really hard to put the supply chain in place so that there are sufficient supplies out there to meet the needs, the estimated needs across the education system. Um, as a backup, the EA ha also has an emergency um, distribution centre and we have been operating that over the last three weekends so that if any school in advance of opening their, their opening date felt that they didn't have sufficient supplies or they felt that an order hadn't been delivered in time, um, we, we helped, we provided them with emergency stocks and, and finally I suppose and John has said that the, the finance colleagues will come back with clarity. Um, and at least two of those letters, I did write out to principals and say that the, this, the funding had been secured at the level that John has alluded to. And we did say that further information would be provided on how that funding would be distributed across the system. Yes, but the, the, the big concern I have in relation to a lot of this is around uncertainty, and this is more directed at, at towards John as the Deputy Permanent Secretary for the Department of Education. Being direct about it, John, I, I think it's absolutely disgraceful that we're sitting in a situation where schools returned, and you can't you can't provide me with an answer, a financial answer to the questions that I am posing to you. To come back and say to this committee today, when you probably should have assumed that we had asked questions in relation to this, and to come without the answers, I don't think is appropriate. Teachers and principals are knocking our doors down, as are unions and others, asking these questions. These aren't questions that are new to the Department of Education or the Education Authority, for that matter, either. Uh, and I'm finding it extremely frustrating that we're sitting in a situation where we can't even answer these questions. To say we'll be back maybe in a week or two weeks' time is still um, not acceptable. As I've said, a lot of these preparations should have been made over the course of the six months. I appreciate that funding has only been allocated in the course of the last number of weeks, but surely this should have been resolved at this stage. Even when we wrecked down the figure, the seven million pounds figure amongst the 41 million, uh, uh, and I think one of the union representatives said this morning, it works at 34 pounds a day, which you know is 170 pounds a week, I think, uh, by rough calculation. Uh, and um, uh, look, how is that going to deal with schools the size of Holy Cross College in Strabane? You know, let's be realistic about it. This is about money. And the reality is, for the Department of Education, I appreciate the financial pressures, particularly at the executive, and you can only get what you've been for. 
But a lot of this holding back in terms of, of, of money is because it's just not readily available. It's not about what the PHA have advised, and it's certainly not about what the science or medical advice advises either. It's a matter of fact that there is just not the money to meet some of the real and serious concerns by teachers and principals and schools out there. And yes, £41 million is a lot of money, but it's not going to scratch the surface in the long term in relation to this. But I am really frustrated that there's no answers to some of these questions, John. And as Deputy Permanent Secretary, you should have been here today with them. And I think other members have also expressed frustration in relation to that as well. Point taken, Daniel. Uh, let me reassure you, we're not in the business of holding money back. Um, in respect of the £7 million that uh, someone quoted earlier on, I'm not sure... Uh, that's that's not a figure I'm familiar with. Uh, in terms of, there is six and a half million allocated uh, for PPE, um, which is I don't know whether that is is what the the previous person was talking about, but that that's certainly for the stocks of PPE uh, and cleaning materials. And is that sufficient? Is that sufficient for? And that is what what the union representative was referring to. Is that sufficient for? Uh, uh, ensuring that schools are fully equipped, £34 a day for a school like, say, Holy Cross College. Uh, Daniel, can I come in on it just on the point? I'm, I'm not going to deal with the costing side of that, but I think it comes back to the expectations stroke aspirations of uh, teachers and the workforce in comparison to what's actually within the guidance. PPE is required only in very exceptional circumstances, uh, and the public health guidance is very clear in that. Uh, that uh, PPE should only have been used in the circumstances where PPE would have been used in the past. So if you if you were in a nursery school and you would have been changing a child's nappy, you would have normally been expected to wear gloves and an apron, and you should be expected to do that now. There is no difference in the requirement for PPE today in schools beyond the particular circumstances of aerial generating procedures which uh, have been alluded to earlier. So the, the, the additional cost that has been incurred by schools has been taken as a precautionary measure to reassure staff it is not within the public health guidance. Uh, yeah. Okay. And, and just, just, on, just on that point. Sorry, we just to make that on the second point, sorry. Um, sorry. Sorry. I'm just going, to make, just going to make a second point, and just to, to reiterate, the six and a half million is is the best estimate that anybody can provide of what it will be to in, to provide PPE in those circumstances, and it's based on the latest costs that have been ascertained from the supply chain, from the EA's position, and, and an estimate of of PPE usage. And I'm quite certain it's a very cautious one, and I'm also certain that it's only for the first term. Um, as an accountant. I can draw up an estimate and I could make that 2 million and I could make it 10 million. Part of the issue is here we don't know what will be incurred until we allow schools to operate effectively. But the guidance is there to say when and where PPE should be worn and to that extent schools should be able to access it and use it as they need to. And not to say the money will follow, blank check, but the processes will be there to make sure that the money as required meets those additional costs. Consistently in our committees, there are a number of questions to be asked. But if members wish to ask a number of questions, we have to really try hard to make sure that we're asking concise questions and not long commentary. So, um, give you a, a brief supplementary there and ask all of us, myself included, to try and stick to concise questioning where we have a number of questions that we need to ask. Thanks, Daniel. Yeah, Chair, just to come back to a point that was raised earlier as well in relation to vulnerable children. Th those children who are vulnerable, uh, many of which will be staying at home during this period, what has DE and DA in place for supporting those children who cannot attend school? Uh, Strand Millis pointed out, for instance, uh, that to date very few teachers had engaged in live sessions due mainly to poor access, reliability issues and limited teacher knowledge about how to design online lessons. So what, what support mechanisms are in place for those children that cannot attend schools, those vulnerable children that cannot attend schools uh, by DE and DA? Yes, we're working very closely with our, our school principals 
And when we, when we define that cohort, Daniel, we'll be making sure that a blended approach is used. Now, obviously, for those children, those clinically vulnerable children, we need to have a range of resources available to them. And that's part of our wellbeing strategy and some of the resources that we'll be developing through that and also through our uh, AOTIS provision as well. And how many children do we know at this stage is affected? I, I don't have that figure in front of me, Daniel. I'm sorry, I can't answer that question. But surely we should be, are we anywhere near that figure, getting that figure? That should be a priority for the yes, EA. We're working, we are, you're absolutely right. We are working through uh, the operations of that with our special school principals and uh, the PHA and the, and the health trusts. And when we have all of the resources in place that we would hope to have in place and we're left with the final figure, we're quite willing to share that, but I don't have that, resource, uh, that figure on, uh, on me at the moment. And do we know how many st school staff are shielding? Because the report as well by NEU uh, once estimated that it could be as high as 40%. Do we know how many staff uh, in schools are shielding still? We're currently carrying out a, a survey with school principals and that data is coming in, but not all of the schools are fully functioning. So when we have that, uh, when all of the schools are back by the end of this week, we'll be in a better position to clarify that. But every single day we lift the data from schools in terms of student attendance and staff attendance, and we're working our way through that. Uh, a very final point, Chair, and, that, and that's it. Strand Mills also in their report recommended uh, that schools be provided with training in relation to trauma recognition in order to support the return of our children to schools. Has DE or EA uh, arranged for this to happen? Yes, Daniel, all of the resources in the wellbeing strategy are based on trauma-informed practice. So all of those webinars, which I have to say were oversubscribed and we're running again and trying to make them available all of the time, are immersed in trauma-based, trauma-informed practice. So yes, all of that is included on, in the documentation and resources provided for schools. Okay, thank you very much. Um, the Chair, just can make one last point, it's very brief. Very brief, go ahead. Yeah, John, uh, it's in relation to the transfer test. I know that this morning it has now been announced that the transfer test be postponed to January 2021. Um, uh, has the department already started making arrangements in relation to this, or is this just since this morning uh, after the, the, uh, the High Court challenge? Uh, Daniel, um, I'm not aware of that. Uh, from the start of this morning, I've been listening into the committee, so that, that uh, information hadn't reached me. Okay, Daniel, I'm no. like, I'm like You raised, you raised an important question in relation to blended learning. Um, there are already pupils not attending school and in need of blended learning. So the idea that we will wait to assess what that cohort looks like is extremely uncomfortable for me. There are already pupils not attending school and in need of blended learning. What assistance is being provided to schools? What um, what monitoring of those situations is happening to ensure that those pupils are receiving remote learning, some of whom may be in year seven, year 12, year 14. Sorry, Chris, I missed the start of that. Are we talking about clinically vulnerable children here or all children? Whatever type of children there are people, we know there are pupils not attending school right now who, uh -huh. who, who should be attending school. So, so what, at present, assistance, oversight is the Department and the Education Authority providing to ensure that those pupils are receiving blended learning at home. Well, you have me to start? Yeah, yeah, I'm, yeah. Uh, first of all, there has been the, the device provision for schools. So we're trying to get as many devices out to young people as possible. Secondly, there's the investment in the Wi-Fi and the MiFi in trying to get connectivity to children on a, on a wider scale. And thirdly, then, there was the uh, access of the virtual learning packages for primary six in, uh, children moving into primary seven. And we know that uh, 164 schools have applied for those virtual packages. So we know that work's going on. I have figures here from yesterday in terms of C2K and online provision. And uh, collaborative platforms are still being used at this time. And schools are still providing support for young people at home, particularly when they know that they're not returning to school. My response to Daniel was in terms of those children who were clinically vulnerable. But schools are monitoring uh, the work that's going out. Schools are being supported by the cross-organizational link officers. 
but it's only when schools are back and established that we will be able to determine how we're going to engage in learning recovery. Hopefully that will be a fairly rapid exercise though because every, every day, every week that lapses when a, a child has not accessed the degree of learning you would wish them to access is a, is a concern for you, I presume. Um, You're okay, absolutely can I, right. Can I bring so just, just to, just to yeah. say there, Chair, you know, yeah. in, in the new school day guidance, schools are aware that we, we've expect, as, as well as the, the support there that uh, Michelle uh, just outlined, we do expect schools to put systems and, and arrangements in place for when pupils are not at school because there will be some that are required to self-isolate, you know, um, if there's a suspected COVID outbreak in their household, and whilst they themselves might be perfectly fit and well, they won't be at school for a number of days, and schools will need to be in a position to continue their, their, their tuition on a remote basis, and obviously the rollout of the, uh, of the laptops and the MiFi will, will help to um, deliver that. Another one to add to the expectation on the school list yeah. um, that you're massing up there, rightly, John, um, that we need to ensure resources are in place to help them. Um, okay, can I move on to Catherine Kelly, please? Thanks, Chair, and thanks everyone for meeting with us today. Um, it was mentioned in earlier contributions that there is a COVID cost centre in place for schools to claim back COVID costs. It has been brought to my attention during th this meeting that school principals are actually not currently aware of this. Um, why has this not already been clearly communicated to principals? I'm unable to answer that, Catherine. My understanding was it had. <clears throat> Excuse me. We can look into that, that Catherine. As, as Dale said, as far as we're concerned, schools know about the cost centre. Um, we'd need to find out, you know, what's going on there. Thanks. I think I think it's very important that schools um, have clear um, direction um, and guidance on, on the likes of the COVID cost centre, especially at the minute when we know that they are under considerable pressure um, financially um, and with everything else that the restart has brought with it. Um, the school leaders, do, they believe that the major costs going forward will probably be staffing. Um, can this be, is this something that can be claimed back through the COVID cost centre? Yes, yes there, the, uh, a bid one, a successful bid was made for money for substitute cover. Yes, so schools will be supported in this area, Catherine. Brilliant, that's, thank, that's, thank you. That's part of the 35 million package, um, Catherine. Uh, that includes substitute cover, te teacher cover. Th thanks for that. Um, just moving on, um, you know, this is probably more for yourself um, in relation to transport. Um, in the special school guidance in June, it mentioned that there was specific transport guidance being drawn up for special schools. Um, I have not been able to find it online, and my apologies if I have overlooked it. Um, was it issued, um, and did special schools receive it? Well, the, the guidance would be more in relation to those providing the transport. It wouldn't necessarily be for the schools, but look, we, we have guidance out there. And within the transport guidance, there's particular elements that are related to children that would have a special transport need. But look, we, we've, we've heard from other sources that they would prefer that was separated out. So we're currently working on that to develop a very specific bespoke piece, but it won't be anything new. It's already there, but we'll just pull it together into the one space, into the one place. Thanks for that, Dale. I think that's also important because it's something that we were raising as a committee um, from the beginning. Um, the fact that we can't just um, add on special schools and guidance to um, mainstream schools. There are many, many issues, um, different issues, more complex issues that need to be taken into consideration. Um, and just lastly, Chair, um, and this is probably more for yourself, John, um, and it's in relation to childcare. Um, NICMA and the Childminders branch of UNITE have presented the Minister with a detailed evidence-based assessment 
of the financial difficulties faced by childminders as, as a result of COVID. Um, with children now back at school and cases on the rise, some childminders are actually having to close their doors for 14 days. When will the minister or department officials be meeting with NICMA and UNITE to negotiate a fair settlement, which takes into account possible loss of earnings in the weeks and months ahead? Yeah, Catherine, I'm, I'm aware about the representations about that, and that they've been asked to, to present, uh, a, for want of a better word, a, a business case type uh, uh, evidence to, to show. I think that's still being considered. Uh, I don't have any uh, details about what the next steps will be, but that's something that we can come back to you on. Um, I think it's in everyone's interest to get that resolved one way or the other as soon as possible. Thank you, John. Thanks, Chair. It's Catherine Morris Bradley. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much for your presentation. Uh, very interesting so far. But a couple of questions uh, on transport. Is there financial support of those private coach operators carrying children to and from school? And if not, can this be investigated? Uh, regarding testing, is it possible to avail of mobile testing units so you can visit school? Uh, I know recently I took part in a mobile testing in relationship to a sporting ev event that was taking place a few days later. The test was brought to the venue. Can such a mobile unit be available to, available to visit schools to test pupils should someone present a positive test for COVID-19? And are schools closely monitoring attendance and the use of test trace to isolate the cases? Is this test trace and protect strategy in place and operational? And following on from that, if there is a localised spike at a school, would that indicate a return to a blended learning approach or the closure of a school? Is the department prepared to circumstances arise to be able to close some or all schools? as happened in March, and uh, all the complications that arose during that initial shutdown. Are schools closely monitoring attendance and the use of tests in place, as I said before, uh, to try and, and, and eradicate any chance of COVID-19 having an outbreak at, at, at school? I'll pick up the first bit, Morris, in terms of transport. Yeah. The, the private coach operators and taxi operators were the first group with the first group of contractors that we um, were able to support through the supplier relief scheme. So they have had access, all of those that are contracted with us have had access to that relief since COVID kicked in mm. in, March, in March this year. In terms of then any additional costs, where, where new contracts have gone out then, suppliers have been able to um, bid for additional money through their normal uh, tendering mechanism for additional costs associated with operating loans for the rest of the year. And then obviously, should there be anything exceptional out with that, they can obviously make it, they can obviously come to the Education Authority and speak about that on an individual case basis. But they have had the supplier relief since March. Okay. Just in terms of test and trace, uh, Morris, when there's an outbreak in, in a school, the PHA operation through their contact tracing service kicks in and there'll be a, uh, a conversation between the contract, uh, contact tracing service and the school principal to, to ascertain what the circumstances are around that, that uh, incident, uh, how many pupils involved, the location. And as part of that, that conversation, uh, there will be advice given to, to help the school to, to deal with that. Now, I think as Adrian said earlier on, one of the, the, key, uh, the key arrangements that we've asked schools to put in place is segmenting of, of, of pupils into discrete bubbles where possible, particularly in, in primary school and the uh, years 10, uh, 8 to 10 in secondary school, uh, 11 to, to 14, it, it's, uh, it's more tricky. However, the, 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 the benefit of, of having this segmentation is that when there has been uh, a COVID incident in a school, the, the school will know, uh, as far as they can, exactly who and where that pupil or pupils have been in contact with. And that helps the uh, contract tracing service do their job uh, more efficiently. So there are, there are processes in place in school to, to uh, establish the segments and the bubbles which will inform uh, the PHA in their work. Mm -hmm. 
All right, so I think, I think your question was, you know, would schools end up being closed as, an, as a result of an outbreak? Yeah. Uh, and PHA advice on that is a, it's quite unlikely unless it's a very, very, very significant outbreak. Um, because of the ability to segment means that you can protect the rest of the school population from those limited numbers that are coming in. Uh, and that's the case that we've seen uh, in Scotland where the, you know, I think there's been one or one or two school closures as part of a wider community transmission in this area. Uh, the PHA will know not just how many pupils that have been involved with any incident in a, in, a, in, a, in a particular town, for example, but also how many other people are testing and that they'll make their judgment based on that. Uh, but the expectation is that, you know, schools aren't sacrosanct in terms of won't be closed, but it is highly unlikely that they would be closed. Okay, thanks very much. Thank you, Chair. Justin McDulty. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, John, Adrian, Michelle and Dale. Um, I appreciate folks, that there's been an enormous effort made over the last number of months to realign education almost, um, and you've all contributed enormously to that. However, it's sad that we have uh, union representatives this morning uh, here who have said that the information is unclear, ambiguous, and open to interpretation. And six months into this pandemic, that's sad that is, that still remains the situation. John, can you tell me what, what do you consider to constitute meaningful constitution with the trade union, or sorry, me, meaningful consultation with the trade unions? unions? Well, Justin, um, as I said before, um, we established these structures back in uh, the, at the beginning of, of uh, lockdown, May, June time, twofold. One with the practitioners group, 20 principals from across uh, Northern Ireland, covering all different phases, and then another group to engage with the trade union side and managing authorities, and they've been involved regularly throughout. The, the guidance was done in co-design with the school practitioners, and we shared it for views and comment for input from trade union side. Um, admittedly, when we put out the uh, latest version back in August, it, that was done at pace. Uh, you know, we had to get um, guidance done and the space that we had for, for that amount of consultation was was uh, was very very limited and the trade union side knew that in advance but as i said we we're not at the end of the of, of the process as we go through and we revise our guidance uh, as, as issues crop up we will be uh, resurrecting those structures to 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 make sure that we hear the, the concerns and that's what we're doing within the department you know we've heard from Dale and Michelle about the uh, the ongoing consultation that they've had particularly on transport and, and issues like that and that dialogue uh, will continue as we go forward um, I think you know we're all on the same page we want schools to to return in the safest possible way that's safe for pupils and, and people that work in and around schools and we're all doing our very best to, to bring that about. It's very important that that uh, consultation is um, elevated as we go forward, um, John. Um, I would say that teachers, principals, uh, school staff, caterers, cleaners, um, groundsmen and the bus drivers, they all deserve enormous credit given that the level of uncertainty, given that they still feel uh, fearful almost, they deserve enormous credit for putting their best foot forward for the sake of the young people, for the children and young people, and they all should be applauded in that. Can you give me a view on terms of the flu vaccination for year eight pupils? Do you believe that that should be extended to staff and other year groups? Well, I'm not a clinician, uh, Justin. I, I, uh, you've, uh, I'm outside my, my sphere of competence when it comes to uh, the efficacy of flu vaccines and, and who, should, who they should be given to. So uh, that, that's one that I would defer to the, the PHA on, to be honest. Yeah, with that in the field, it's not really logical to give to one year group and not to staff. And um, it's, it's surely there would be strong rationale to give it to the whole school body. Um, can Justin, I if, I, if I can come in there, um, the, the vaccination programme will be at, um, a recommendation based on a based on a, a group of clinicians at a national level. They make the recommendations to England, Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland, uh, and that's what that's 
all of the vaccination programs are based on that and based on clinical evidence. I'm basing this on my own previous experience in the health department. Uh, and, you know, it'll be health officials and the PHA who will be led by that evidence as to what is the right level of vaccinations for our general population. Uh, and that's all we can say. You know, we, we'd be led by the science here and we expect health officials to lead on that. Um, I've been contacted by a number of concerned pupils, sorry, uh, teachers and parents in relation to the guidance for children who are ill. Can a simple parent-friendly leaflet be distributed so that parents are under no, un uh, no um, uncertainty and are completely clear about when they should bring, keep their kids at home? I've just I'll that. As we said, we're, we're in the process of drafting a, a, a leaflet that would go to all parents to try and explain the symptoms. Uh, we, are, we are ultimately led by the public health agency guidance on what those symptoms are, uh, and we will make sure that that guidance is cleared by the public health agency. I understand, for example, that in Scotland they have written to parents um, to explain the difference between a, 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 your, gen, your normal cough and cold and sniffle uh, and a long continuous cough, and, and we will be uh, taking anything that we can get to help explain that uh, and, and to use that to explain. The guidance at present is too ambiguous and too up in the air and too open to interpretation, so that's, that should be strong and, strong and unambigu unambiguous guidance uh, issued as soon as possible. How soon can we expect that to be issued? Uh, the leaflet is currently being drafted. I, I, as to whether it can be strong and unamb unambiguous, uh, it, that's almost impossible. Uh, you will only be able to give a set of guidance and a set of criteria. Uh, public health officials are reluctant to go beyond the, the, the existing symptoms that are there. Uh, and um, uh, therefore, us as individuals, they're the same as given to our GPs and clinicians. Uh, and actually, our advice will be that schools and parents should take a very much a precautionary approach. But if they believe that those symptoms uh, are there, uh, they should uh, keep their children at home or they should remain at home and go through the test and trace symptoms, uh, the test and trace process, and get that validated with a, a negative or a positive test. That's the best means of breaking transmission within the system. Okay, in terms of the numbers of shielding staff or shielding pupils, how is that data being lifted? Uh, uh, in terms of number of shielding, uh, health officials have again talked to us around the numbers of 80,000 80, to 100,000 number of people who've been shielding across the province. Um, uh, in terms of the general workforce, um, I'm the, talking about in terms advice. of teachers, staff. In terms of teachers, uh, the, the guidance from the PHA is very clear that, that shielding no longer applies and therefore you can return to work. And that's the guidance in just in general public health guidance. Uh, what we've done is to institute an arrangement where, again, to reassure staff uh, that the system and the procedures are clear, that we're looking at a, 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 a risk assessment that was a, a joint approach going through. Uh, it, it doesn't require medical advice. It's about saying, here are the systems in place for an individual coming back into school who has been shielding. Uh, and, and that is uh, very clear that, that, again, from the health point of view, that the, the entire system of mitigations that have been put in place makes schools a safe place to both work and learn. An issue has come to me, as, you know, a constituency matter, a, a mother concerned about her son who has dyslexia and who has had literacy support for the last academic year. Um, and this meant that the child was taken out of the classroom on a weekly basis uh, and getting specialist one-on-one -on -one support. As of this year, as of the arrival of COVID, that support has been halted. The mother is very, very concerned. So what, what advice, or what guidance, what, what answer can you give me? What, what, what would you tell me to say to that mother in terms of what she should expect for her child and how many other children are in a similar scenario? And what are you saying and what are you doing to address that matter so that children who were getting additional support, um, and who, who, that's, whose support has now stopped, when will that recommence? Uh, Justin, obviously I don't know the particulars of that, that case, but there, no decision has been made to stop literacy support on in, in, any, in any school uh, unless the child's um, circumstances have changed. And again, I can't comment on one single case, but I do know that literacy, literacy support in schools not only hasn't been ceased, 
but uh, the Engage programme will be launched very soon where extra support for schools will be given in terms of literacy and numeracy, ICT and health and wellbeing and learning recovery to make sure that anybody, any loss of learning is picked up. So I, I, I don't know the particulars of the case, but I'm not aware of any literacy support being removed. Whereby uh, member of staff can move between different individuals uh, to give them specialist support? Again, again the, 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 it, this is about the interpretation of the guidance by individual schools. Um, you know, if, a, if a, a teacher is involved in one-to-one -one, uh, tuition with an individual pupil uh, and they can maintain social distancing, even if they move between bubbles, there is absolutely minimal risk and therefore there's nothing to stop it. And, and that is actually the same position because I understand from our health colleagues that the normal uh, speech and language therapy and all the other uh, health interventions that are in school, whether that be educational psychologists or whatever else, will be returning to as near to normal operation over the next few weeks. They will be following their own protocols in terms of uh, PPE because they are very clearly moving between school environments. and school classrooms etc but you know in terms of managing that process they are you know there is no different from it from a, a speech and language therapist going in to see an individual <laughs> child in school a and driving 10 miles to go to school b uh, we have to find ways to manage those risks and i understand and i can empathize with principals who are taking a very much a precautionary approach in dealing with their staff in these first few weeks but i would say no reason why that should want to be continued from the Education Authority this morning to that parent in relation to the child not having a continuation of a specialist support for their dyslexia and that to me is very, very worrying. Okay, Justin, again, I can't comment on one particular case. There may other, be other mitigating circumstances. That's something I would have to look into and I will when I get back. Okay, I'll, I'll forward the details and I would like that to be addressed. Uh, pronto, please. Uh, and finally, I've raised on multiple occasions the issue of um, at-risk children and uh, them, their return to school and how, the, how their challenges will be identified and are, are, are teachers proactively looking out for kids who may have been under uh, duress during the pandemic, um, under severe duress from um, conditions at home. What, what's, what processes are in place to identify those kids and to give them the help and support yeah, sorry. As I say, Justin, um, a lot of resources have been put online and a lot of training has taken place for staff on uh, webinars in how in based and it's been immersed in trauma uh, informed practice. So all of the work that's going on in school is to identify the well-being and where children are in their learning. So absolutely that is the focus and a lot of resources are available both in school and on the EA website and the department website in, in terms of that. Guys, I appreciate you are under huge dress as well, and you're doing your best. So thank you very much for your responses today. Thank you. Thanks, Justin. Uh, John, Michelle, um, as Daniel alluded to earlier, the Education Minister has advised the High Court that transfer tests for post-primary admissions 2021 will be delayed to January the 9th, 2021, with the Education Authority operating a compressed timetable for the admissions and appeals process. Um, my position remains that the impact of COVID-19 faces a responsibility on the Education Minister, AQE, PPTC and schools to find a better way to administer post-primary transfer than high-stakes tests for 10-year-olds, preparation for which will now span the Christmas holidays. It appears to quash the Education Minister's assertion that he has no control over the transfer process as well. Can you advise what the new schedule for post-primary admissions will be, how that is deliverable and at what additional costs? Chair, um, obviously that, that was breaking news today. I think you know we would need to, to work through the ramifications of that in terms of uh, resources and timescales. Uh, not at liberty to, to, to give you an answer on that here and now. Education Minister consult with the Education Authority with regards to that compression of the Education Authority's operation of the admissions and appeals process prior to this announcement? Chair, I can confirm, yes, that the Education Authority was involved in providing information to the Minister around the, the timetable for the admissions process. 
What is the new timetable then? Sorry? What is the new timetable? Well, we, we, we haven't agreed the specific timetable. Again, we were providing information to the Department of Education around that. So uh, I don't know what the exact ramifications are for us in terms of our timetable, um, but we will come back to you about that. So has the Education Minister committed the Education Authority to a new timetable without agreeing with you what that new timetable is? Just... We'll come back to that. We'll, we'll, we'll need to come back to you on this, Chair, uh, I'm afraid. Uh, you know, I, I wouldn't want to mislead uh, the, the members of the committee on any aspect of this, so I think um, we would need to uh, we need to come back to you in slower time. Appreciate you'd like to come back to me, but I think those are fairly straightforward questions to answer. Well, personally, I don't know the answer, so well, well, that's, the I, there's nothing more I can say to you than that. Okay, and, the, and as I say, I'm not going to speculate. Okay, um, so the Education Authority are, are present. The Education Authority is referenced in the, the public announcement that's made today to say that they will be operating a compressed timetable for admissions and appeals process. I, I presume you know what that compressed timetable is or you are aware that you've been committed to it. So what, what, Chair, what I can say is we, we were able to confirm that we were able to operate to shorter periods of time for various elements of the overall timetable, but I don't have the detail in front of me. Which, which, you, which previously the Education Authority and the Department of Education said they could not. So what has changed? Well, again, we, we've done more work on that in consultation with the Department of Education, and we've been able to identify opportunities to streamline elements of our administration. And additional cost? Uh, elements of it will be at additional cost, yes. How much? I, do, I don't have that figure in front of me, Chair. You must have costed it. Pardon? Well, it must have been costed. They wouldn't just make a decision without having costed. Yes. Or, ha or have I, you? Yes, it was costed, yes. Okay, so what, what, at what additional cost? And is that being met by the Department of Education or the Education Authority? Well, well, again, Chair, given that the announcement is made by STEM staff in the room, I can't give you that answer, and I don't, I don't have the cost in front of me. Okay, and that's so. Well, and, 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 you know, Chair, it, it, it might not be a satisfactory answer for you, but it's not part of my uh, area of responsibility, uh, transfer test. So I think the best we could do is, is come back to you on this, uh, okay. because it, it none is. of us in the room. Are across across this particular area of DE policy, I, I presume it's it's known to the education authority representatives in the room. I mean, Chair, I've given I've given you all the information that I currently have available to be able to give to you whilst I'm here. So you don't know the additional cost of this compressed timetable for admissions and appeals. No, not by I, I don't have the figure in front of me. If I did have the figure, I would give you the figure. Okay. Final question on this, what, what allowances will be made for any P7 pupil who loses further school-based education time due to COVID-19? That's part of the ENGAGE programme, Chair. Uh, no, sorry, sorry. The I, mean, I mean, sorry, I mean specifically in relation to post-primary admission and transfer test 2021. Oh, what, what, what allowances will be made for any P7 pupil that loses further school-based education time due to COVID-19? with regard to post-primary transfer 2021 and the transfer tests? I think, again, again, Chair, um, the, the, the policy branch that are dealing with that are not in the room with us today. Um, we would need to get back to you on that. I, I don't know the answer to that. OK. I, I realise the public announcement has been made via a court process and that court process would have had to have been respected before engaging with the Education Committee, but the Department and the Education Authority will be aware of the extent of this committee's engagement in that issue and I would appreciate urgent update in response to those questions that I've asked from the Department and the Education Authority. OK. Point taken, Chair. Okay, thank you. Uh, any further questions, members? No? Okay. Jo uh, witnesses, thank you very much indeed for your time today. Um, we'll be in, in further contact on a range of those issues that we've covered. Thank you.
Thank you. Just ask. Broadcast, can you bring the members back in and take oh, Okay. Can I just ask Assembly Broadcasting to bring all the members back in and take witnesses out and ask the clerk to give a very brief summary of um, actions that we've agreed in our, our session with the Department of the Education Authority today? So, members, we are on our quorum. I will be brief then. Uh, so, uh, if I've understood correctly, the committee wants to write to the department asking initially for them to set out the Permanent Secretary and Minister's diary commitments today, which meant that they were unable to appear. Um, calling for clarity on what schools should do when children are symptomatic. Um, also asking, I think, for clarity from the Department around maternity cover and will they indeed cover the additional costs. Then, in terms of the mechanism for allocating additional funding and the timescale, we're basically asking for that. Uh, just for clarification around the cost code, as uh, um, Kelly asked. Uh, then, repeating the question we asked before, uh, to confirm the numbers of medically vulnerable children um, and the, um, you know, how many are requiring risk assessments and how far through they are that process and will there be a support package in place. Also then asking the department about staff attendance and pupil attendance. It's early days yet but they should um, have those numbers shortly. And additionally calling upon them to issue guidance to schools and parents around distinguishing cold flus uh, from COVID and when to keep your child um, at home. And then additionally, separate letter writing to the Department of the Education Authority asking about the new timescale for post-primary transfer, the additional costs will be involved and whether and what allowance will be made for P7s who will have missed some of their schooling owing to COVID. Agreed. Yeah. Agreed. Okay, Clark, conscious of time here, if we agree the forward work programme, are we safe to defer the further business to next week? So, Chair, unless members have, and there's a, a ton of correspondence, I think most of it will keep, um, unless members have particular items that they've noted that they want to um, make to have action straight away. But other than that, they're content to defer. Just to go back to that point I raised just to finish, so sorry Chair, um, I would like to see what, what specific actions the Department are taking to address the, the concerns I have around at-risk children who have been at home for six months without any uh, escape, and what, what specific actions are they taking to identify those children and to give them the support and help that they may need? Hey Chair, just, just to advise members, maybe we'll talk about this another day, this is a question the members asked lots of times, yeah. and the Committee has asked lots of times. And I don't know that the committee has actually got an answer and that thus this, this process is not working for the committee. I, I, I'm, I'm sensing, I think, from members, keep me right, um, so that maybe you need another way to ask that question. That might be something we talk about again. So not in any way saying it's not important. I sense from the members it's very important. But looking at the answers we've had so far, I, I sense the member is dissatisfied and has not got the answer he wanted. Uh, so maybe a different approach is needed. But we'll ask again for now just to keep it on the boil. I think that's fair. If I if if members content with that, members have no other issues to raise, no. No. Okay. I Clark, I think if we defer the the further business or sorry, members content to agree the forward work programme. It's at page four eight one of your packs. If if anyone wants to take a quick glance at that. Just a quick one, Clark. Chair, on that is um, members had wanted a briefing from the panel on underachievement. Yeah. Um, now, no party has written to us. It's actually in tabled items, I think, and he's indicated they, they'd rather come later um, and after they've reported. So, um, yeah, it's at page 28 of uh, tabled items. So our members then content. We'll just take that off the forward work programme. I'll find something else to put in there. So just, to, so just to understand, Clark, they've, they've asked them, I presume, to come and brief us on their terms of reference, their yep. intended approach, matters like that, and they've responded to say they would prefer to come and brief us after they've completed their work. Um, what they're saying is that they're about to conduct a series of stakeholder engagements, uh, which will include with uh, political parties, so that what they're saying is that members will have their opportunity there to, if they wish to, challenge on the terms of reference, um, uh, etc., uh, and that their suggestion is that they come again um, um, whenever they've actually produced their report. 
Oh, because I'm, not, I'm not particularly comfortable with that. I don't know about members. Um, I, I think it's fairly um, routine for us to request that they come and brief us on their terms of reference and the intended approach. It doesn't need to be a long briefing or a long session with many questions, but um, uh, members content if we return to say we would actually appreciate uh, an initial briefing on the intended terms of reference and approach. Me? Yeah. Okay, see what they say, Clark. <laughs> yeah, no, no, I'm, I'm sure they'll come. Um, I'm happy for it to be at their convenience. I realise they'll have a, a busy schedule. Um, okay, other than that, members content with the forward work programme and that we defer correspondence and a couple of other matters into next week's schedule, given the time of the day. Yeah. Yeah, agreed. Agreed. Okay, the time and place of next meeting then is next Wednesday the 9th. Um, Room 29, 9.30am. Committee meeting does now adjourn. Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30.